Poem, The Birds, and Singers and Their Songs, of Birds of Song and Story. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Birds of Song and Story by Elizabeth and Joseph Grinnell. The Birds. They are swaying in the marshes, they are swinging in the glen, where the cattails air their brushes in the zephyrs of the fen, in the swamp's deserted tangle, where the reed grass wets its scythes, in the dismal, creepy quagmire, where the snake gourd twists and writhes. They are singing in arroyos, where the cactus mails its breast, where the Spanish bayonet glistens on the steep bank's rocky crest. In the canyon where the cascade sets its pearls of maiden hair, where the hay and the holly beckon, valley sun and mountain air. They are nesting in the elbow of the scrub oak's knotty arm, in the gray mesh of the sagebrush, in the wheat fields of the farm, in the banks along the sea beach, in the vine above my door, in the outstretched clumsy fingers of the mottled sycamore. While the church bell rings its discourse, they are sitting on the spires, song and anthem, psalm and carol, quaver as from mystic lyres. Everywhere they flirt and flutter, mate and nest and shrub and tree. Charm, I wander yon and hither, while their beauties ravish me, till my musings sing like thrushes, and my heart is like a nest, softly lined with tender fancies, plucked from nature's mother breast. Elizabeth Grinnell Singers and Their Songs and hark, the nightingale begins its song, most musical, most melancholy bird. A melancholy bird? Oh, idle thought! In nature there is nothing melancholy. Tis the merry nightingale that crowds and hurries and precipitates with fast, thick warble his delicious notes. Coleridge Some barbarous peoples possess a rude taste for the beautiful plumage of birds, decorating their bodies in feathers of softest and brightest tints. But we have record of few, if any savage tribes the world over, which delight in bird melody. True, the savage may seek his food by sound or even song, but to feast the ear on music for music's sake, ah, this is reserved for culture. An ear cultivated to melody is one of the soul's luxuries. Attuned to sweet and varied sounds, it may become the guide to bird secrets never imparted to the eye. Sitting in the close shrubbery of a home garden, or crouching moveless in a forest, one may catch whispers of bird language never imparted to human ears when the listener is moving about or talking with a comrade. If one has accidentally, or by patience, discovered the evening resort of shy birds, let him precede the birds by half an hour. Sitting low among rocks or fallen trees, having the forethought to wear plainly colored clothes, and as moveless as the neighboring objects, one may be treated to such a feast of sounds as will both surprise and entertain him. The birds will come close, and even hop over one's coat sleeve and shoes, though so much as a full-fledged wink may dissipate the charm. Just before bedtime there are whisperings and salutes, and low-voiced conversations and love notes, and ohs and ahs at sight of a belated insect, and lullaby ditties and if one be possessed of a good deal of imagination, evening prayers. Birds that fly from their nighttime perches in the thick shrubbery in the morning dusk with a whirr and a scream or emphatic call note, in evening time just whisper or sing in half-articulate tones. To be out in their haunts late in the day and very early in the dawn is to learn things about birds one never forgets. And if one chance to remain late at night, one may often hear some feathered person mumble, or talk, or scold, or complain, or sing a short melody in his sleep. Some students of bird lore suggest that all night singers, like the mockers and some thrushes, do talk in their sleep, instead of from intent and choice. If one will watch a tame canary in its cage, one may hear a very low, sweet warble from the bird while its head is tucked under its feathers. This act wakens the little creature, and it may be seen to finish its note while it looks about in the lamplight in a half-bewildered way. Take our domestic fowls. Go noiselessly out to the chicken roost and stand stock still for a while. 
now and then some hen or cock will speak a few words in its own language in a rambling dozing way then the suggestion passes on and perhaps half a dozen individuals engage in nocturnal conversation one more nervous from yesterday's overwork perhaps actually has a nightmare and cackles in fright all this has no connection with the usual time for the head of the family to give his warning crow that midnight or daytime is close at hand and there is scarcely time for another wink of sleep once in the secret of bird notes even a blind person may locate the immediate vicinity of a nest and he may identify species by the call notes and songs we have a blind girl neighbor who declares she would rather have her hearing than her sight she has learned so well to hear what her sight might deprive her of when once the ear has learned its better lessons glimpses so to speak of bird life flutter to it as naturally as leaves flutter to the sward in autumn it is the continual chatter chatter that deprives many of us of the best enjoyments of life we talk when we should listen nature speaks low more often than she shouts a taciturn child or person finds out things that are worth the habit of keeping still to know these remarks are in the interest of singing birds a bird is sometimes interrupted and comes to a sudden stop a footstep a word a laugh and the very next note is swallowed by the singer by studying our songsters one may come to know for oneself how individuals differ even among the same species there is a sad-voiced phoebe even she forgets her customary dismal cry at certain times when flies are winging their midday dance on invisible floors that never were waxed it is when she takes a flat stand on the roof corner and bewails her lot that her notes are utterly disconsolate take a couple of phoebes on a cloudy day just after one's folks have gone away from home on a long visit and nothing lends an aid to sorrow like their melancholy notes really we do believe phoebe thinks he is singing but he has mistaken his calling some of the goldfinches have a plaintive note especially while nesting which appeals to the gloomy side of the listener if he chanced to have such a side were coleridge listening to either of these the phoebe or the goldfinch he would doubtless say in answer to the charge of the sadness a melancholy bird o oh, idle thought in nature there is nothing melancholy and he would have us believe the birds are merry when they sing and so they shall be merry even the morning dove shall make us glad she does not intend to mourn the appearance of sadness being only the cadence of her natural voice she has not learned the art of modulation though the bluebird and the robin and all the thrushes call her attention to the matter every year if one will closely watch a singer unbeknown to him when he is in the very act one may note the varying expression of the body from the tip of his beak to the tip of his tail sometimes he will stand still with closely fitting plumage and whole attitude on tiptoe sometimes he will crouch and lift the plumage and gyrate gracefully or flutter or soar off at random on quick wings sometimes he sings flat on the breast like a song sparrow or again high up in the sky like the lark however he sings heaven bless the singer the earth would be a cheerless place were there no more of these but legend tells the story of singing birds in its own way the story of a time long long eons ago when not a single bird made glad the heart of anything or anybody true there were some large sea birds and great walking land birds too deformed for any one to recognize as birds in these days but there was no such thing as a singing bird one day there came a great spring freshet the greatest freshet ever dreamed of and all the land animals sought shelter in the trees and high mountains but the water came up to the peaks and over the treetops and sorrow was in all the world suddenly a giraffe stretching its long neck in all directions espied a big boat roofed over like a house the giraffe made signs to the elephant and the elephant gave the signal as elephants to this day do give signals that are heard for many a mile so they say then there came a scurrying for the big boat a few of all the animals got on board by hook or crook and the rain was coming down in sheets all at once along came the lizards crawling up the sides of the boat and hunting for cracks and knot holes to crawl into 
just as lizards are in the habit of doing on the sly to this day but not a crack or knot hole could they find in the boat's side for the loose places wide enough for a lizard to flatten himself into had all been filled up with gum or something then the lizards began to hiss exactly the way they hiss to this day when they are frightened and the big animals inside the boat poked out their noses to see what was to pay oh they are nothing but lizards exclaimed the giraffe to the elephant who had naturally taken possession of more than his share of the only foothold in existence let them drown in the freshet but a big awkward land bird with teeth and a tail like a church steeple took pity on the lizards and gnawed a hole in the wall of the boat of course in trooped the lizards once in they disposed themselves in nooks and corners and right under the flapping ears of the elephant and between the pointed ears of the giraffe and they began to whisper it was a very low hissing whisper as if they had never gotten farther than the s's in the alphabet but the big animals understood plenty of room was made for the lizards and they were allowed to make a square meal now and then on the flies that had come in at the boat's door uninvited plenty of them after a few days the spring freshet came to an end and the giraffe opened the door of the boathouse and looked out he made signs to the elephant and the elephant gave the signal and out walked all the animals on dry ground which to tell the truth was rather muddy when all the other creatures were out of the boat it came the lizard's turn but the elephant and the giraffe bethought them of something and turned back to the boat you promised us you promised us they cried to the wriggling lizards that hadn't a single thing about them to make anybody desire their company in land or sea so we did promise they answered hissing their words then the lizards all turned facing each other and rose and stuck out their long tongues just as lizards do to this day and breathed on one another and made a sizzling noise suddenly from each side of their long tails appeared pin feathers which grew very fast till the scales were all disappeared and then little baby feathers appeared on their backs and breasts and four legs or arms which overlapped each other like scales and were beautiful and soft and many tinted beaks grew in place of the wide mouths only the hind legs were left as they were but these two began to change they grew long and slim and hard but the nails remained as they were before only stronger then the lizards were reptiles no longer but beautiful birds and with one accord they began to sing each singing a different song from his neighbor and making the clear air ring with melody and the giraffe made signs to the elephant and the elephant signaled all the other animals to return and so they returned and they could hardly believe their eyes when the elephant told them these were the crawling lizards that had come into the boathouse the last thing but he assured them they were the very same and then he told them how the lizards had promised him and the big giraffe that if they would be permitted to stay in the boat with the rest until the spring freshet was over they would be angels ever afterward and spend all their time when they were not eating and sleeping and making glad melody for all the animal world while the giraffe was speaking the birds lifted their wings which an hour before were bare arms and soared out and up into the blue sky singing as they went and this was the origin of the singing birds to explain how to this day there are plenty of lizards of all sizes and colors the legend hints its sequel to the story not all of the lizards were able or even willing to go into the boathouse being naturally shy and the holes the big birds pecked in the walls were all too soon sealed up almost drowned the remaining lizards crept up on the backs of the great water dragons the leviathan and behemoth which nobody knows anything about in our day and so were saved anyhow we have them on warm days sunning themselves on fence rails and bare rocks or scurrying under the stumps and stones but they are always on good terms with the birds for we have seen them basking in the sun together and they eat the selfsame insects the lizards are no doubt discussing with the birds the approach of another spring freshet when they too will bethink them of the boathouse and so come by feathers and songs harmless they are as the birds whom they resemble in many ways we have taught some of them to drink milk and honey from a teaspoon and to peck at insects in our fingers to come at our call 
and to lie in our hands. To some they are beautiful creatures, to others they are nothing but lizards. Boys throw stones at them, and girls wish there were no lizards. They are so ugly. Oh, the pity of it! If these would but turn the creatures tenderly over, they would see beautiful colors on the underside, that sparkle and glisten like the breast of a brightly tinted bird. We are acquainted with one lizard as long as a mockingbird, with a breast as silver-gray, and we love to think of the time, of course it is imagination, though they do say there is possibly some truth in it, when another spring freshet, or something, will turn the little reptile into the bird he resembles. End of the Bird Singers and Their Song Chapter One of Birds of Song and Story. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Birds of Song and Story by Elizabeth and Joseph Grinnell. Our Comrade the Robin. Robin, Sir Robin, gay vested knight, now you've come to us, summer's in sight. You never dream of the wonders you bring, visions that follow the flash of your wing. How all the beautiful by and by around you and after you seems to fly. Sing on, or eat on, as pleases your mind. Well have you earned every morsel you find. Aye, ha, 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 whistles Robin. My dear, let us all take our own choice of good cheer. By Lucy Larcombe on account of its generous distribution and the affection for the bird in the heart of young America and England alike, the robin shall be given first place among the singing birds. He is the little wanderer, as the name signifies, the Robinson Crusoe of almost every clime and race. True, he may be a warbler instead of a thrush in the old world, but what does that signify? To whatever class or family he may belong by right of birth and legend, the bird of the red breast is the bird of the human breast. It is impossible to study the early history of birds in any language and not stumble upon legend and superstition, and the more we read of these, the more we come to delight in them. There may not be a bit of truth in the matter, but there is fascination. It is like delving among the dust and cobwebs of an old attic. The more dust and cobwebs, the more fun in coming upon things one never went in quest of. Of course, superstition has its objections, but when the robin is the point at issue, we may waive objections and go on our merry ways, satisfied that the oldest and clearest head in the family will concur. Legends concerning our comrade the robin are full of tender thought of him. They have kept his memory green through the rain and shine of centuries, even going so far as to embalm him after death, as will be seen. It is well-nigh impossible to give the earliest date in which the robin is mentioned as a sacred bird. Certain it is that he ranks with characters of ye olden time for myth and superstition enshrined him. The literature of many tongues has preserved him. Poetry and sculpture have embodied him and given him place among the gods and winged beings that inhabit the neighbor world. Did he not scorch his original gray breast by taking his daily drop of water to lost souls? Did he not stain it by pressing his faithful heart against the crown of thorns? Or did he not burn it in the far north when he fanned back into flame the dying embers which the polar bear thought to have trampled out in his wrath that white men invaded his shores? Was he not always the pious bird, though it must be confessed that his beak alone seemed to be possessed of religious tendencies? Was he not the original church sexton, who covered the dead with impartial beak, from eye of sun and man, piling high and dry the woodland leaves about them, the wandering minstrel, the orphan child, or the knight of kingly robe which shared his sweet charity? The English ballad of the Babes in the Wood immortalized his memory in poetical sentiment. Quote, their little corpse the robin redbreast found, and strewed with pious bills the leaves around. Earlier than the pathetic career of these babes, homage was paid to the robins. Quote, 
who with leaves and flowers do cover the friendless bodies of unburied men this superstition of the robin's art in caring for the dead runs through many of the old poets drayton graham hood herrick and others strict justice in the matter would have divided the praise of him with the charitable night winds for it was they more than he who covered friendless bodies the sylvan shades of the old world being then more comprehensive than now unburied men from any cause found their last resting-place in the lap of the forest sleeping wherever they fell since no laws of decent burial governed the wilds the night winds true to their instincts then as now swirled the fallen leaves about any object in their way in the fashion of a burial shroud as a matter of course credit was given to the robin whose voracious appetite always led him to plunder litter of any sort in search of food up bright and early as is still his habit since at this hour he is able to waylay the belated night insect the robin was spied bestirring the forest leaves and unbeknown to himself was sainted for all time and his duties were not confined to those of sexton alone for according to good witnesses he became both sculptor and clergyman Quote, for robin redbreasts when i die make both my monument and elegy Unquote. stripping as they were supposed to do the foliage from the trees on which to write their elegies and so leaving the uncovered trunks as monumental shafts according to tradition it was the robin who originated the first conception of decorating the graves of martyrs Quote, the robin redbreast oft at evening hours shall kindly lend his aid with hoary moss and gathered flowers to deck the grave where thou art laid and again from one of the old poets who was naturally anxious that his own last rites should be proper as well as pathetic quote, and while the wood nymphs my old corpse inter sing thou my dirge sweet warbling chorister my epitaph in foliage next write this here here the tomb of robert herrick is unquote. and so it came to pass by the patronage of the poets that in the early centuries this little bird came to be protected by an affectionate unwritten law to molest a redbreast was to bring the swift vengeance of lightning on the house the ancient boy knew better if he cherished his personal safety than to steal a young bird for the purpose of captivity for a robin in a cage sets all heaven in a rage the sobbing sobbing of pretty pretty robin would surely call down upon the head of the luckless thief the dire displeasure of the deities as runs the rhyme meant in all reverence as it should also be quoted the robin and the wren are god's almighty cock and hen him that harries their nest never shall his soul have rest terrible punishments were thus meted out to the ancient urchin whose instincts would lead him to rob birds nests in pilgrim's progress christiana is said to have been greatly astonished at seeing a robin with a spider in its beak said she what a disparagement it is to such a little pretty bird as the robin redbest is he being also a bird above many that loveth to maintain a kind of sociableness with man i had thought they had lived on crumbs of bread i like him worse than i did and the wordy wise interpreter to clinch a moral lesson in the mind of the religious woman explained how the robins when they are by themselves catch and gobble up spiders they can change their diet like the ungodly hypocrite drink iniquity and swallow down sin like water and so obedient to her spiritual adviser christiana liked the robin worse than she did poor soul she should have observed for herself that for a robin to gobble up a spider is no iniquity did she think that crumbs grew on bushes ready-made for early breakfast or that the underside of woodland leaves was buttered to order spiders the robin must have else how could he obtain the strings for his harp wherever the spider spins her thread there is her devotee the robin he may not be seen to pluck and stretch the threads but the source of them he loves and he says his best grace above this dainty of his board our pet robin was known to stand patiently by the crack of a door asking that it be opened wider as in his opinion a spider was hiding behind it he heard her stockinged tread as he hears also the slippered feet of the grub in the garden sod provided the grubs have feet which is known that they can do tolerably well without sure it is that world over be he thrush or warbler 
The robin is partial to bread and butter, to bread thrice buttered if he can get it, fat of any sort he craves, the more practical and sentimental believe that he uses it in the preparation of the colours done in oil with which he tints his breast. For lack of oil, therefore, where it is not provided by his friends or discovered by himself, his breast is underdone in colour, paling even to dusky hue, so that, would you have a red breast of deepest dye, be liberal with his buttered bread." and his yellow mouth. Ah, it is the colour of spring butter when the dandelions are astir, oozing out, as it were, when he's very young, as if for suggestion to those who love him. The historical wedding of Cock Robin to Jenny Wren was the result of anxiety on the part of mutual friends who would unite their favourite birds. The courtship, the merry marriage, the picnic dinner, and the rest of the tragedy are well described. Alas! for the death and burial of the robin groom, who did not live to enjoy the bliss of wedded life as prearranged by his solicitous friends. But the affair went merry as a marriage bell for a while, and was good until fortunes changed. All the birds of the air combined to make the event a happy one, and they dined and they supped in elegant style. Quote, for each took a bumper and drank to the pair. Cock Robin, the bridegroom, and Jenny Wren, the fair. Just as the dinner things were being removed and the bird guests were singing, fit to be heard a mile around, in stalked the cuckoo, who it is presumed had not been invited to the wedding and was angry at being slighted. He rudely began pulling the bride all about by her pretty clothes, which aroused the temper of the groom, naturally enough, as who could wonder. His best man, the sparrow, went out and armed himself, his weapons being the bow and arrow, and took his usual steady aim to hit the intruder, but like many another excited marksman, he missed his aim, and, oh, the pity of it, he shot Cock Robin himself. It was an easy way for the poet to dispose of the affair, as he knew very well a robin and a wren couldn't mate in truth. Nor did the sparrow deny his unintentional blunder when it came to the trial. There were witnesses in plenty, and Robin was given a splendid burial, Robin, who had himself officiated at many a ceremony of the same sad sort. It is a pathetic tale, as any one may see who reads it, and serve the purpose of stimulating sympathy for the birds. We have forgiven the sparrow for his blunder, as will be seen later on, for in consequence of it the birds were called up in line and made to do something, thus distinguishing themselves as no idlers. The mating of Robin with Jenny Wren proved a failure, of course, so we have our dear twa birds, the robins, as near alike as two peas, when the male is not singing and the female is not cuddling her nest. A trifle brighter of tint is the male in North America, but the two combine, like any staid farmer and his wife, in getting a living out of the soil. Hand in hand, as it were, they wander about the country anywhere under the flag, at home, wherever it rains, but returning to the same locality, with true homing instinct, as often as the springtime suggests the proper season for family affairs, completing these same affairs in time to look after their winter outfit of clothes. This last more on account of their annual shabby condition than by reason of the rigours of cold, for they change climate as often as health and happiness, including, of course, food, require. True, some penalties attach to this sudden and frequent change, but the robins accept whatever comes to them with a protest of song, returning good for evil, even when charged with stealing more fruit than the law allows. It is impossible to compare the good they do with any possible harm, since the insect harvest time is always, and the robins' farming implements never go rusty. Always in the wake of the robins is the sharp-shinned hawk, and many another winged enemy, for their migrations are followed by faithful foes who secrete themselves in the shadows. We deprived one of these desperados of his dinner before he had so much as tasted it, also of his pleasure in obtaining another, for we brought him down in the very act and rescued his victim only by prying apart the reluctantly dying claws. But whatever may be said of hawks, and other such hungry beings who lay no claim to a vegetable diet— their so-called cruelty should be overlooked, since it is impossible to draw the lines without affecting the robin himself. For see with what excusable greed he snatches at winged beings which happen to light for a rest in their flight, or draws the protesting earthworm from its sunless corridors. 
It is a law of nature, and grace must provide absolution. So must also the bird-lover, supposing in his charitable heart that worms and flies delight in being made over into new and better-loved individuals. Would the bird-lover actually convert this red breast from the error of his victual ways? He may do so by substituting cooked or raw food from his own table. The robin is an apt student of civilization and adopts the ways of its reformers with relish. As to the statement that robins require a diet of worms to ensure life and growth, we can say that we have raised a whole family on bread and milk alone with perfect success. True, we allowed them a bit of watermelon in melon season, but they used it more as a newfangled bath than as a food, actually rolling in it and pasting their feathers together with the sticky juice. The farmer's orchard is the robin's own patch of ground, and he revels in its varied bounties. A pair of them know at a glance the very crotch in the apple tree which grew three prongs on purpose for their nest. The extreme centre, scooped to a thimble's capacity, suggests the initial post hole for a proper foundation. The said post may be placed directly across it, but that does not change the idea. Above is the parting of the boughs, across whose inverted arches sticks alternate, and so on up. And atop of straws and leaves and sticks is the loving cup of clay, with its soft lining of vegetable fibre and grasses. What care the robins that little cover roofs them and their young? Are they not water birds by nature, and wind birds as well? Our pet sat for hours at a time in hot weather, immersed to his ears in the bath, and even sang low notes while he soaked. Birds of spring freshets and June winds, they dote on the weather, and bring off their young ones as successfully as their neighbors. What if a nest be blown down now and then? The schoolboy, in passing, puts it back in its place, and sees that every birdling goes with it, while the old birds above him, shedding water like a goose, thank him for his pains. The orchardist, who plants a mulberry tree in his apple rose, though he himself scorns the insipid sweetness of the fruit, ranks with any philanthropist in that he foresees the needs of a little soul which loves the society of man more than anything else in the world. By the planting of the mulberry tree he plants a thought in the breast of his little son, I don't like mulberries, father. What makes you set out a mulberry tree in an apple orchard? For the robins, my son. Haven't you heard that luck follows the robins? What is luck, father? Luck, my son, is any good thing which people make for themselves and the folks they think about. And the little boy sits down on a buttercup cushion and meditates on luck while he watches the robins knocking at the doors of the soft-bodied larvae, engaging in making luck for other folks, and the boy's own luck takes the right turn all on account of his father setting out a mulberry tree. Whole schoolrooms full of children are known to be after the same sort of luck when they plant a tree on Arbor Day, a cherry tree, or mulberry tree, or even an apple, in due time is sure to bring forth just the crotch to delight the heart of Mother Robin in June. Not that the robins do not select other places than apple trees to nest in, an unusual place is quite as likely to charm them. Let a person interest himself a little in the robin's affairs, and he will see startling results by the summer solstice. An old hat in the crotch of a tree, an inverted sunshade, or even a discarded scarecrow, terrible to behold, left over from last year and hidden in the foliage, one and all suggest possibilities to the robins. Mud that is fresh and sweet is essential to a robin's nest. Stale, bad-smelling, sour mud isn't fit for use. Sweet, clay-like stuff is what they want. A pack of twigs made up loosely, soft grass and fiber, all delight the nest builders, who are as sure to select a location nearby as they are sure to stay all summer near the farmer on account of the nearness of food. Anywhere from four to thirty feet one may find the nests with little trouble. They are so bulky all but the delicate inside of them, which is soft as down, nest lining being next thing to nest peopling, the toes of the little new people finding their first means of clinging to life by what is next to them. A well-woven lining gives young robins a delicious sense of safety as they hold on tight, the instinct to hold on tight being about the first in any young thing, be it bird or human baby, except perhaps the instinct of holding its mouth open. Some people, who do not watch closely, suppose the young robin who holds its mouth open, the longest and widest, gets the most food. 
We are often mistaken in things. Mother Robin understands the care of the young, though she never read a book about it in all her life. Think of her infant of exactly eleven days, leaving the nest and getting about on its own legs, as indeed it does, more to the astonishment of its own little self than anybody else. And before the baby knows it, he's singing with all the rest. Cheat up! Cheat-dee! Cheat-dee! Cheat up! The very same song we heard him sing within the Arctic Circle, far up to the snow line of the Jade Mountains, alternating his song with the eating of juniper berries. But one might go on forever with the robin as he hops and skips and flies from the Atlantic to the Pacific, and from Alaska to Mexico and other parts, but one would never get to the end of loving him. When poor robin at last meets with disaster, and cannot pick himself up again, in short, is gone to that world where birds are blessed. The leaves shall remember to cover him, while we imagine with the poet who thought it not time and talent wasted to write an epitaph to the red breast. Quote, Small notes wake from underground where now his tiny bones are laid. No prowling cat with whiskered face approaches this sequestered place. No schoolboy with his willow bow shall aim at thee a treacherous blow. But the funeral of even a robin is a sad event, so we will bring him back in the spring, for, quote, There's a call upon the housetop, an answer from the plain. There's a warble in the sunshine, a twitter in the rain. End of chapter one. Read by Sandra, near Montreal. This reading is dedicated to my aunt, Fran. Chapter 2 of Birds of Song and Story. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Birds of Song and Story by Elizabeth and Joseph Grinnell. Chapter 2 The Mockingbird. Wit, sophist, songster, Yorick of thy tribe, thou sportive satirist of nature's school, to thee the palm of scoffing we ascribe, arch-mocker and mad abbot of misrule. For such thou art by day, but all night long thou pourest soft, sweet, pensive, solemn strain, as if thou didst in this thy moonlit song, like to the melancholy Jacques complain, musing on falsehood, folly, vice, and wrong, and sighing for thy motley coat again. Oscar Wilde in his native town or district, the mocker stands at the head of the class as a songbird. He is not distinguished for his gorgeous plumage, like a parrot, nor yet for the mischief he does, like the crow. His virtue is all in his throat. And yet he can scarcely be honored as an original genius. Were he original, he would be no mocker. But he has an original way with him for all that, when he takes the notion to mimic any person. Were he a man as gifted, we should have no trouble in seeing ourselves as others see us, or better, in hearing ourselves as others hear us. He is the preacher, the choir leader, the choir itself, the organ. He gives out the hymns, chants the Amen, and pronounces the benediction in the garden church. Few verses have been inscribed to the Mockingbird, for the reason it is supposed that sentiment intended for any known singer fits the mocker though it must be conceded that he is a humorist more than a poet. It is impossible to listen to his varied songs and keep from laughing, especially if the mood be on one. Where the weather is very mild, he sings all winter, and nearly all the year. His fall molt takes but a few weeks, and then Richard is himself again. His humor does not desert him, even at the trying season of molting his coat, for he is seen to stand on a bough and preen himself of his old tatters, catching a falling feather in his beak, and turning it about in a ludicrous way, as if laughing to himself at this annual joke of his. Dropping the remnant of his summer plumage, he cants his wise little head, and gives a shrill cry of applause as it floats away. Whatever may be said of his musical powers, the mocker exceeds his fellows in the art of listening. We have known him to sit the better part of an afternoon, concealed in thick foliage, listening with all his might to the various songs about him, with full intention of repeating them at midnight. And repeat them he does, not forgetting the postman's whistle, nor the young turkeys just learning to run in the wet grass, 
to an untimely grave. He has an agreeable way of improving upon the original of any song he imitates, so that he is supposed to give free music lessons to all the other birds. His own notes, belonging solely to himself, are beautiful and varied, and he sandwiches them in between the rest in a way to suit the best. We imagine that he forgets from year to year and must have his memory stirred occasionally. This is particularly so in his imitation of the notes of young birds. We never hear them early in spring or very late in autumn after he has completed his silent molt. In late summer, however, when the baby birds have grown into juveniles, then old man mocker takes up his business of mimicking the voices of the late nursery. Until we knew his methods, we would start at peculiar sounds in the garden and cry to one another, there's a late brood of young ones, and run to locate the tardy family. From his perch on the chimney, the mocker laughs at us while he squeals like his own little son of a month old, or coaxes like a whole nestful of baby linnets. No matter who is the victim of his mimicry, he loves the corner of a chimney better than any other perch, and carols out into the sky and down into the black abyss as if chimneys were made on purpose for mockingbirds. A neighbor of ours has a gramophone which is used on the lawn for the entertainment of summer guests. Think you that big brass trumpet throat emits its uncanny sounds for human ears alone? Behind it, or above it, or in front of it, listening and taking notes, is the mocker. Suddenly, next day or next week, we hear, perhaps at midnight, a concert up in the trees, song sparrows and linnets and blackbirds and young chickens and shrikes and peewees and a host of other musicians, clear and unmistakable. Then, as suddenly, the whole is repeated through a gramophone. And we listen and laugh, for well we know that the only source of it all is our dear mocker. How he gets the gramophone ring, we do not know, any more than we know how he comes by all his powers of reproduction. Of practice he has plenty, and his industry in this respect may be the key to his success. The male differs so slightly from his mate that the two are indistinguishable save at song time. They pair in early spring and are faithfully united in all their duties. They nest mostly in bushes or low branches from four to twenty feet from the ground. The nests are large and often in plain sight. Like the robin and other thrushes, the mocker's first thought is for the foundation. This is made of large sticks and grasses, interlaced and crossed loosely. Upon these, the nest proper is placed, of soft materials lined with horsehair or grasses. With the mockers, as with other birds, there is not a fixed rule as to nesting materials. Outside of a few fundamental principles as to the foundations and so forth, they select the material at hand. Where cotton is to be obtained, they use it, and strings in place of grass. Leaves in the foundation are bulky and little trouble to gather. We have found a pair of mockers very sly and silent just at nesting time, or the female will be at the nest work while her mate is singing at a distance, as if to distract us from the scene of action. However, in our grounds, where we have taught all birds extreme confidence, the good work progresses in plain sight. One writer has declared that a pair of mockers will desert a nest if you so much as look at it. This is true only where they are very wild and unaccustomed to human friends. When once the young are hatched, the fun begins. During the day the male ceases to sing and devotes himself to giving exact information as to where the nest may be found. Of course, this information is unintentional. He flies at us if we step out in sight, screaming with all his might. The nearer we approach the nest, the louder and nearer he cries, until he actually has an attack of hysterics and turns somersaults in the air or quivers in the foliage. If it be possible to reach you from behind, he dives at your shoulder and nips at your hair. Always from behind, never facing you. His quiet mate flits through the boughs as if she understands her husband's exaggerated solicitude and half smiles to see his performances. In a day or two, the young birds are able to speak for themselves, and from this on until the next brood of their parents is hatched, the youngsters keep up a coaxing squeal. Getting out of the nest in about two weeks, they fly awkwardly about, easy prey to cats and other thieves. From a nest of four or five eggs, a pair of mockers will do well if they raise two or even one. Night birds find them easy to steal, for they sleep on the ground or under a bush at first, being several days in learning to fly, and a much longer time in learning to eat by themselves. 
This year, three sets of young mockers were raised on raspberries. They were brought to the patch as soon as they left the nest, where they remained on the ground, among the drooping canes. The old birds kept with them, putting in all their time at teaching the awkward things the art of helping themselves. The parent bird would hop up a foot or two, seize the tip of the end of a twig, on which was the usual group of berries, and bring it down to the ground, holding it there and bidding the young ones to take a bite. Not a bite would they take, squealing with mouth open and waiting for the old bird to pick the berry and place it in the capacious throat, the yellow margins of the base of the beak shining in the sun like melted butter. And butter these birds like, as well as the robins, for they come to the garden table and eat it, with the bread and doughnuts and pie, like hungry tramps. Unlike the ashy white of the parent breast, the juveniles have a dotted vest, very pretty to look at, which disappears at the first molt. The natural food of the mockingbird is fruit and meat. They catch an insect on the wing with almost the cunning of a flycatcher, and listen on the ground like a robin, for the muffled tread of a bug under a log or in the sward. They are not like the tyrants they are sometimes accredited with being. The mocker does not fight a pitched battle with other birds as often as opportunity offers. Like many another voluble being, his bark is worse than his bite. Not his weapon, but his word is law. So fraternal are the mockers, as we see them, that the close coming of them near the house in spring ensures us the company of many other birds. It is hard to outwit the mockers. They love fruit of any sort, as well as they love insects. They dote on scarecrows, those guardian angels of domestic birds, and have been seen to kiss their cheeks or pick out their eyes. We caused one of these terrors to stand in the Christmas persimmon tree in the garden, thinking that, for fright of him, the mockers would stand aloof. It rained, and the first bird that came along snuggled under his chin with the hat brim for an umbrella. That was a linnet. Along came a mocker and took refuge under the other ear of the angel. We tied paper bags around the fruit, but the mockers bit holes in the bags and took the persimmons. We pinned a sheet over the whole treetop, but peepholes were sufficient. In went the mockers like mice and held carousals under cover. Tamed when young, and given the freedom of the whole house, a mockingbird feels fairly at home and is good company, especially if there be an invalid in the family. The bigger the house, the more fun, for the limits of the cage in which birds are usually confined form the greatest objection to keeping them in captivity. Few cages admit of sufficient room for the stretch of wing in flight, or even for a respectable hop. We know of no bird save the parrot which chooses to be caressed. Birds are not guinea pigs to be scratched into good terms. It spoils the plumage and disagrees with the temper. A mocker on the ground never trails his coat skirt. He lifts his tail gracefully, as if he knows that contact with the grass will disarrange his feathers. In Evangeline, Longfellow immortalized the mockingbird thus. Then from a neighboring thicket, the mockingbird, wildest of singers, swinging aloft on a willow spray that hung o'er the waters, shook from his little throat such floods of delirious music that the whole air and the woods and the waves seemed to listen. Plaintive at first were the tones, and sad, then soaring to madness, till having gathered them all, he flung them abroad in derision, as when, after a storm, a gust of wind through the treetops shakes down a rattling of rain in a crystal shower on the branches. End of chapter 2 Recording by Olivia Chapter 3 of Birds of Song and Story. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jill Engel. Birds of Song and Story by Elizabeth and Joseph Grinnell. The Catbird. Why, so I will, you noisy bird. This very day I'll advertise you. Perhaps some busy ones may prize you. He is not always the cat bird. Oh, no. He is one of our sweetest singers before day has fairly opened her eyes. Before it is light enough to be sure that what one sees be a bird or a shadow, the cat bird is in the bushes. Singing as he flits, this early riser and early eater 
passes from bush to bush on the fringed edge of morning, conscious of happiness and hunger. With a quaint talent for mimicry, he tries to reproduce the notes of other birds with partial success, giving only short snatches, however, as if afraid to trust himself. In the hush of evening, when the cricket's chirp has a drowsy tone, the catbird makes his melody, each individual with cadences of his own. Now like a thrush, and now like a nightingale he sings, though he is not to be compared with the mockingbird in powers of mimicry. Yet his own personal notes are as sweet as the mocker's. But like most persons, he has another side, on which account he came by his name. And his mate is Mrs. Catbird as well, for she, too, imitates the feline foe of all birds, more especially at nesting time. There is a legend to fit the case, as usual. The bird was once a great gray cat, and got its living by devouring the young of such birds as nest in low bushes. All the birds met in convention to pray the gods they might be rid of this particular cat. As no created thing may be absolutely deprived of life, but only transformed into some other being, this cat was changed into a bird, henceforth doomed to mew and scream like a kitten in trouble. Its note long since ceased to have much effect upon the birds, who seldom mistake its cry for that of their real enemy in fur and claws. Not so its human friends, for it takes a fine ear indeed to distinguish the bird from a cat when neither is in sight. Now this bird, doom, as the superstition runs, to prowl and lurk about in dark places near the ground, seldom flies high, nor does it often nest in trees. This does not prevent the singer from exercising his musical talents, however, more than it does the meadowlark or the song sparrow. It is in midsummer that the catbird is best known as the bird that mews. Then both birds, if one approaches the nest, fly at the intruder, wings drooping, tail spread, beak open, whole attitude one of scolding anger. In this mood the bird fears nothing, even making up to a stranger, and pecking at him. If it would pass with the waning summer and the maturing of the young birds, this bad temper of the catbird would be more tolerable. But once acquired, the habit clings to it, and it may be that not till next winter will it get over the fit. The favorite site of the catbird for nesting, as we have observed it, is the middle of a patch of blackberry bushes, so dense and untrimmed it would be impossible for anyone save a bird to reach it. Even the parent birds must creep on all twos, or dodge along beneath the briars. We have known it to build in a thick vine over the door. The catbird and brown thrasher were always together in our Tennessee garden, each fearless, nesting near the door, eating the same food, but differing in personal habits. The catbird's nest was in the blackberries, the thrasher's in the honeysuckle. We often borrowed the young thrashers for exhibition to our friends in the parlor. After the first time or two, the parents did not care, but watched quietly from the vine for the return of their darlings. The catbird neighbor, always prying about, took note of our custom and played spy in the honeysuckle. At the first opening of the door, out peeped a black beak from which proceeded the familiar cat cry we had learned not to heed. Pay no attention to this self-appointed guardian of the little thrashers, we took them into the parlor, where they would remain for half an hour. All this time the catbird kept up its mewing and screaming at the door outside, nor did it cease until the birds were placed back in the nest. The custom of the catbirds everywhere to play the detective and sound the note of warning in behalf of all the other birds is well known. Is there danger anywhere, they rush to the rescue with imploring cry, setting up a great agony of sound and posture, very ludicrous, if not pathetic. And the poor catbird is always at sword's point with the farmer. Scarecrows aplenty deck the orchards and ornament the gardens. More do these historical and sometimes artistic beings serve to ease the farmer's conscience than to intimidate the birds, 
for it is well known that catbirds thrive best under the grotesque shadows of the scarecrow. And the more horrible of face and figure are these individuals created, the more are they sought after by the very birds they are intended to scare out of their wits. It will probably take another generation of fruit men to wake up to the fact that these and other birds habitually mistake the scarecrows for a guideboard to ways and means, or a sign for home cooking. Would the farmer stop when he has finished the very worst scarecrow he can conjure up, out of last year's trousers and coat and hat and straw from the bedding mow? The birds would have fair play. But the shotgun, alas, picks off the poor little mew bird almost as fast as he himself picked off the berries an hour before, and so the farmer is accused of having no heart. But the farmer's boy of the bare feet and brown legs loves the funny bird. He will sit for an hour near its briar-bound nest, chuckling at its screams and gestures, and wondering why it isn't a cat for good and all. Hast thou named all the birds without a gun? Oh, be my friend, and teach me to be thine. Emerson End of chapter 3《ハッピー・ of Birds of Song and Story》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Kathleen Danielson. Birds of Song and Story by Elizabeth and Joseph Grinnell. The Hermit Thrush. Thrush, thrush, have mercy on thy little bill. I play to please myself, albeit ill. And yet, though how it comes to pass, I cannot tell. My singing pleases all the world as well. Montgomery. Hermit that it is, this little thrush is known and loved in nearly all of North America. True, there are several of its relatives about in fields and woods, which are taken for the hermit by those who have not compared the different birds, the plain, deep, olive brown above, with dotted creamy vest, being a popular dress with the thrushes. The hermit answers to several names, suiting the location in which it is found. In low parts of the south, it is known as the swamp robin. You meet it in the damp, shady places where it is always twilight, in the fascinating grounds of the snails and water beetles. It likes such clammy, silent neighbors, with their retiring habits and proper manners, for the reason that it is able to turn them to some account at mealtime, which, as is the case with most birds, is all the time or any time. It is said to resemble in habits and notes the English song thrush, which is known to spend most of its time at certain periods of the year hunting snails, which it has learned to dress for eating by slapping them against a stone. It will choose a stone of the proper shape to which it carries its snails as often as it has good luck in the hunt, leaving little heaps of shell by the stone to mark its picnic ground. Family affairs bring little labor to a pair of hermits, for they have not far to go in search of nesting materials. They take what is close at hand, little dry twigs, lichens, and last year's leaves crumbled and moist, which soon lose their dampness and adhere together in a thick mass. But few have found it, this nest of the hermit, hidden under the bushes where it is always shadowed, and where the fledglings may help themselves to rambling insects without so much as stepping out of the door. They are supposed to take advantage of this nearness to food by remaining about the nest later than most birds. Or if they run, returning on foot, of course, having tardy use of their wings, but learning to stretch their legs instead. And well may they learn to stretch their legs, as they will come to their fortunes by footing it mostly, when they are not migrating on the wing. Like the thrashers, the hermit must scratch for a living when berries are not ripe. By listening, one may hear the bird at its work, and by slipping quietly in the dusk of the early morning to the lowlands or the thick woods and standing stock still for a while, even see it. But nearly always it is under cover on the edge of thickets, where the leaf mold is unstirred and richest. And always by its own self is the hermit, as if it loves nature better than the company of its fellows, listening now and then for underground or overhead sounds and dwelling on the beauty of the leaf skeletons it overturns like a botanist. Lace work and dainty insertion in delicate threads does Madame Hermit find in her resorts. Fabric so marvelous and fascinating, she could admire it forever. 
cast off finery of such insects as outgrow their clothes, grasshopper nymphs and whole baskets full of locust eggs hidden in half-decayed logs, and making a nourishing breakfast, rare done and delicious. She delights in the haunts of the praying mantis at egg-laying season, surprising the wonderful insect in her devotions, who scarcely has the time to turn her head on her foe before she disappears from sight. It is well for her thus to disappear suddenly, for she is spared witnessing the fate of her newly laid eggs just above her on the twig, their silken wrapper being no obstruction in the way of Madame Hermit finishing her meal on them. These habits of the hermit thrush mark the dwarf hermit in Southern California. We see it in the orange groves after irrigation or during a wet winter. Plenty of mulching in the orchards invites the dwarf, where it is a hermit like its relative, and we find it scratching away in the litter, overturning frail little toadstool huts and umbrellas, and exchanging greetings with its neighbor, the varied thrush, under the next tree. Here in the canyons, where the brooks turn right side up for one brief season in the long dry year, we see the little olive-brown bird with its speckled breast. Its sight and hearing are keen so that it detects the whereabouts of the stoneflies, lingering among the moist rocks until they come out for a drink or a bath, when that is the last of them. The dwarf brown beauty, which of course must have victuals by hook or crook, never breaking a single law in either case, loves the watery haunts of the dragonflies. It passes by the pupa skin drying on its leaf stalk just as it was outgrown, with perchance a glance at the reflection in the water. But the cunning bird neglects not to take in the pupa itself, making its own breakfast on undeveloped mosquitoes in the water's edge. All winter long about our home lives the dwarf hermit, eating crumbs at the garden table and looking for belated raspberries on the evergreen canes. Early, before the sun is up, the bird runs along under our windows, where the myrtle covers the tracks of night insects and rings its tinkling notes. These resemble the familiar bell notes that belong to the wood thrush, cousin of the hermit and the dwarf hermit. Not so numerous as its relatives, the wood thrush is seen only in eastern North America. It nests in trees or bushes, packing wet decaying leaves and wood fiber into a paste, which dries and resembles the mud nest of the robin. It, too, gets its food in the litter of leaves and wet places, choosing fens and cranberry bogs in the pastures. All the thrushes delight in berries, and any berry patch, wild or cultivated, is the bird's own patch of ground. The sadder the day, the sweeter the song of the wood thrush. Nature lovers who stroll into the thickest of woods on a cloudy day on purpose to make the acquaintance of the thrush will find... The heart unlocks its springs, wheresoe'er he singeth. The notes of all the thrushes are singularly sweet, and may be recognized by their low, tinkling, bell-like tones. At the funeral of Cock Robin, who did not survive his wedding day in the legend, it was the thrush who sang a psalm, and he was well qualified, as he sat in a bush, if such a thing were possible, no doubt bringing tears to his feathered audience. The throstle with his note so true in the Garden of Bottom, the fairy in Midsummer Night's Dream, was the thrush of Shakespeare's own country. No fairy's garden is complete without this sweet singer described so truly by Emily Tolman. In the deep solemn wood at dawn I hear a voice serene and pure, now far, now near, singing sweetly, singing slowly, holy, O oh holy, holy, Again at evening hush, now near, now far. O oh, tell me, art thou voice of bird or star? Sounding sweetly, sounding slowly, holy, O oh, holy, holy. End of section, chapter four. Chapter five of Birds of Song and Story. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jill Engel. Birds of Song and Story by Elizabeth and Joseph Grinnell. The Grosbeaks. Have you ever heard of the singaway bird that sings where the runaway river runs down with its rills from the bald-headed hills? that stand in the sunshine and shiver? 
Oh, sing, sing away, sing away. How the pines and the birches are stirred by the trill of the sing-away bird. And beneath the glad sun, every glad-hearted one sets the world to the tune of its gladness. The swift rivers sing it, the wild breezes wing it, till earth loses thought of her sadness. Oh, sing, sing away, sing away. Oh, sing, happy soul, to joy's giver. Sing on by time's runaway river. Lucy Larkham You would recognize it anywhere by its beak, and you may call this feature of the face a beak, or a nose, or a hand, or a pair of lips. In either case, it is thick, heavy, prominent, the common characteristic of the gross beaks. Individuals may differ in plumage, but always there is the thick conical bill. Oh, oh, what a big nose you've got! And, oh, oh, what a red nose it is! We exclaimed when we first met the cardinal face to face in a thicket. In a moment we had forgotten the shape and tint of the beak in the song that poured out of it. It was like forgetting the look of the big rocks between which gushes the waterfall in a mountain gorge. Not that the mouth of the gross beak was built to accommodate its song, but, that being formed for other purposes, it nevertheless is a splendid flute. Whichever he may be, the cardinal, or the black-headed, or the blue, or the rose-breasted, the gross beak is a splendid singer. On account of its gorgeous coloring, the cardinal is oftenest caged. But to those who love the wild birds best in their native freedom, the cardinal gross beak imprisoned lacks the charm of manner which marks it in the tangle of wild grapevines and blackberry thickets. Seldom still in the wild, unless it be singing, the red beauty flits and dodges between twigs and dips into brush and careens through the thickest undergrowth of things that combine to hide it, now here, now there, and everywhere. One would think its bright coat a quick and certain token of its whereabouts, but so active is the lively fellow that it eludes even the sharpest eye, a stranger mistaking its gleam for a rift of sunlight through the treetops. Legend tells us that the beak of this bird was once ashen gray and the face white. Once on a time, a whole flock of them were discovered in the current rows of a mountaineer, who called on the gods of the woods to punish them, since he himself was unable to overtake the thieves. The gods, willing to appease the old man, yet loving the gross beaks better, dyed their beaks crimson from that moment and set black masks on their faces. Thus was a favor done to the cardinals, for ever after the juice of berries left no stain on their red lips, while the black masks set off their features to the best advantage, interrupting the tint of the beak and the head. He is no ecclesiastic, though he wears the red cap of the cardinal, which he lifts at pleasure, for he gets his living by foraging the woods and gardens for berries at berry time. The cardinal's companion is modest of tint, ashy brown with only traces of red below, deepening on wings, head, and tail. Bird of the bush is she, and she places her loosely made nest in the thicket, where she can easily obtain bark fiber and dry, soft leaves and grass. In it, she sees that three or four chocolate-dotted eggs, like decorated marbles, are placed and she repeats the family history two or three times a season, where the season is long. At first, the lips of the baby bird are dark, but they soon blush into the family red. In plumage, they resemble the mother for a time, but before cold weather, the males put on a coat of red with a black mask. In the respect of molting, the cardinals differ from their young cousins, the rose-breasted, the latter requiring two or three years to complete the tints of adult life. But born in the thickets are the rose breasts, just like the cardinals, the nest being composed of the selfsame fibers and woodland grasses. Strange craft of Mother Nature is this, to bring the rose breast and the cardinal from eggs of the very same size and markings. But so she does, so that a stranger coming upon either nest, in the absence of the mother bird, might mistake it for that of the other. You can't be certain until you see the old birds. 
The rose-breasted grosbeaks are found east of the Rocky Mountains and north into Canada. It migrates south early and returns to its summer habitat rather late in spring. The lips of the rosebreast are white, not red, while the feet are grayish-blue, differing from the brown feet of the cardinal. How did it come by its breast? Why, legend has it that the breast was white at the start. One day he forgot himself, not knowing it was night. He was so happy singing the funeral hymn of a robin redbreast that had died of a chill in molting time, as birds do die when the process is belated. And the grosbeak sang on until a night owl spied him and thought to make a supper of a bird so plump. But the owl mistook his aim and flew away with only a beak full of the breast feathers, he not taking into account the nearness of the molt. The gross beak escaped, but lacking a vest. The robins gathered pink wild rose leaves and laid them on the heart of the singer, not forgetting to line the wings, and so from that day to this the psalm singer is known as the rose-breasted gross beak. The head and neck of the male and most of the upper parts are black, the tail white and black combined, wings black variegated with white, and the middle breast and under wing coverts the rich rose that deepens into a carmine. The beak is white. The mother bird is streaked with blackish and olive brown above, below white tinged with dusky under wing coverts, the tint of saffron. Her beak is brown. These beautiful birds may be seen in the haunts of autumn berries, early spring buds that are yet encased in winter wrappings, and orchards in the remote tops of whose trees have been left stray apples. By the time these are frostbitten, they are ready cooked for the belated rose breasts, whose strong beaks seem made on purpose to bite into frozen apples. But frozen apples have a charm of taste for anyone who takes the trouble of climbing to the outer limbs for a tempting recluse. Better were more of them left in the late harvest for boys and girls and the rose-breasted grosbeaks. An invisible thread fastened to a solitary apple on a high twig and connected inside of the attic window of the cottage suggests winter fun of a harmless sort. The gross beaks fish for the apple, which all of a sudden is given a jerk from a watchful urchin inside the window, and the bird realizes the historic slip twixt the cup and the lip. The string being, to start with, almost invisible, is from necessity very weak as well, and breaks at about the third jerk. The fun for the participants inside the window at the other end of the string is over for a time, and before it is readjusted, the apple has several bites in it. And besides, there are other apples. On the Pacific coast, we have the black-headed grosbeak, cousin of the others and equally gifted in song. The sides of the head, back, wings, and tail of this male are black, though the back and wings are dotted with white and cinnamon brown. The neck and underparts are a rich orange-brown, changing to bright pure yellow on the belly and underwing coverts. The bill and feet are dark grayish-blue. The female and her young differ in the underparts, being a rich sulfur yellow. Upper parts are olive-shaded, varied with whitish or brownish stripes. The habits of the black-headed grosbeak are like those of the others described. From our custom of making the grounds as attractive to all wild birds as possible, never relenting our vigilance in regard to the feline race, we have had splendid opportunities of studying this bird. They have nested with us for three years, beginning in wary fashion and ending in perfect confidence. The first of the season we saw only the male, and he kept high in the blue gum trees, fifty or sixty feet or more above ground singing as soon as everybody was out of sight, but disappearing if a door opened. We thought him a belated robin, so do the songs of the two birds impress a stranger. For weeks we could catch not so much as a glimpse of the singer, though we hid in the shrubbery. Shrubbery was no barrier to the sight of the keen little eye and ear above. Then we took to the attic, and from a little roof-corner pane beheld the musician— 
but his song was short and ended unfinished, so suspicious was the bird. Gradually, he came to understand that no shotgun disturbed the garden stillness, even though he sat on an outer bough, and no cat lurked in the roses. He also appeared to notice that nobody played ball on the greensward, nor threw stones at stray chickens. Altogether, circumstances seemed favorable to Sir Grosbeak, and he brought Madame along down from the mountain canyons. By midsummer of the second season, the two were seen at sunrise, as low as the tallest of the orange trees, but they flew higher or disappeared if the door were opened. It was the year that we first planted the row of loganberries, a new cross between the blackberry and raspberry. It was between the orange and lemon trees in a quiet corner of the orchard, and the grosbeaks espied them, reddening a month before they ripened. By getting up at dawn, we made sure that nesting operations had begun within twenty feet of the loganberries. But which way? It was not until the eggs were laid that we found the site on a low limb of a fig tree adjoining the berry row. The nest was made solely of dried dark leaf spines, and so transparently laid that we could distinguish the three eggs from below. There was no lining, plenty of ventilation, in this and other of these grosbeaks' nests observed in the foothills being the rule. Perhaps the climate induces the bird to this sanitary measure. Certain it is that this nest could be no harbor for those insect foes that too often make life miserable for the birdlings. The summer passed, and we gave up the row of berries to the grosbeaks. There were but few, anyway, and we wanted the birds. And there was other fruit they were welcome to. This season the grosbeaks have brought off three broods within fifty feet of the house. The male sings in the low bushes and trees, and does not think of punctuating his notes with stops and pauses, even though we stand within a few feet of him. In fact, the birds are now as tame as robins. Young striped fledglings grope about in the clover, or flutter in the bushes as fearless as sparrows. If we pick them up, they will support themselves by a grip on the hand, and swing by their strong great beaks, screaming at the top of their shrill voices to let go! when it is themselves that are holding on with might and main. If they scream long enough and their beaks do not weaken in their clutch, the mocker comes to rescue and scolds us while we explain the situation, extending our hands with the gross beak clinging to the palm. So far as we have known, all the nests in our grounds have been built in the crotch of a fig tree. The fig has sparse foliage and affords little shelter, but then there are figs that ripen most of the summer, and figs are good for baby grosbeaks. Once we discovered a nest by accident, the bees at swarming time settled in the top of a fig tree, a place not at all suitable in our opinion. We were busily engaged in tossing dust into the tree to frighten the bees out, when a grosbeak appeared, scolding so hard in her familiar motherly tone that we knew we were sanding her nest as well as the bees and we found it all right. She went on with her work after we had attended to the bees. On account of the fondness of the birds for fruit and buds, the grosbeaks might easily become resident in any home grounds. Low shrubbery they love when once they have become familiar, unlike the thrushes not caring particularly for damp places. Dry, baked-in-the-sun nooks, crisp undergrowth, and especially untrimmed berry rows fascinate them. During mating season, the male sings all the time when he is not eating, singing as he flies from perch to perch, and like others of the family, has been accused of night serenades. We are unable to know, certainly, if it is our gross beak or the mocker that wakes us at midnight. It is probably the mocker who has stolen notes from all the birds. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of Birds of Song and Story」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter Birds of Song and Story by Elizabeth and Joseph Grinnell Chapter Six The Orioles a rosy flush creeps up the sky. The birds begin their symphony. 
I hear the clear triumphant voice of the robin bidding the world rejoice. The vireos catch the theme of the song, and the Baltimore oriole bears it along, while from sparrow and thrush and wood peewee, and deep in the pine trees the chickadee, there's an undercurrent of harmony. Harriet E. Payne It is a merry song, that of the oriole. It belongs to the family, and once heard will be always recognised. Sometimes it is a happy laugh, sometimes a chatter, especially at nesting time, when a pair of birds are selecting a place for the hammock. Always, wherever heard, the song of an oriole suggests sunshine and a letting go of winter and sad times. The name itself is characteristic of the bird, for it signifies yellow glory, and a yellow glory the oriole surely is, whether it be found in Europe or America, and whether it be called hangbird, or yellow robin, or golden robin, or fiery hangbird. The term hangbird suggests the fate of a convict, but the oriole is no convict. His transgressions against any law are few and far between. The name simply denotes the conditions of its start in life. The hanging of an oriole occurs before it is out of the shell, at the very beginning of its career. The skill of the orioles in the art of weaving nests is unsurpassed by any other bird. Always it is nest weaving, not nest building. Not a stick or piece of bark do they use, nor a bit of mud or paste. The beak of the orioles differs so widely from that of the gross beaks that one has but to compare them to be interested. One might almost imagine the bill of a gross beak to be a drinking cup, or a basket with an adjustable lid or cover shutting slightly over, while that of the orioles is sharp and pointed, sometimes deflected, longer than the head of the bird, parting it is true, but the upper and lower mandibles meeting so exactly together that at the tip that they form a veritable needle or thorn. And a needle it is, on the point of which hangs a tail, the tail that has given to this lovely being the nom de plume of hangbird. True, the orchard oriole fastens its nest in the forks, giving it a more fixed condition than is the case with the strictly pensile nests, but it too is woven with artistic designs, the threads interlacing in beautiful patterns. No more could a gross beak weave an oriole's nest with its big, clumsy, thick bill than could an oriole crack pine cones to pieces with its needle beak, each to its own tools when it comes to individual tricks. And there are the feet of the birds, fitted only for perching, not for walking. The nearest we ever came to catching an oriole on the ground was when we compelled a July grasshopper to sit in a birdcage under a tree. The oriole went in at the door, and the grasshopper went out of the door. We tried it again, and each time the bird and the hopper went out together, the oriole assisting its friend, for whom it has a special fondness. The fondness is not returned on the part of the hopper. We were sorry for the grasshopper, and wishing to continue our experiments, secured the dry skin of an insect, which we tied to the perch of the cage. The oriole entered warily, took a bite, discovered the trick, and never came back. Perhaps the Baltimore oriole is best known, not being confined to the city whose name it bears. It came by its name very much as many other birds came by their names, and will continue to come by them. About 1628, Lord Baltimore, on an important visit to America, heard a chatter in the top of a maple, and looking up, beheld the colours of his own livery, black and yellow. The colours were animated and flitted from place to place, at last seeming to laugh at the Englishman, who had come so far from home to find his coat of arms out of reach. Baltimore recognised the bird as an aristocrat and bestowed upon it his own name on the spot. And a lord the oriole is to this day, black and orange in colour, varying in tint with age and season of the year. New clothes, 
whether on birds or people, fade with wear and sunshine and lose the luster of newness. Everybody knows the Oriole. You can't make a mistake. That is, you know the male. You may not be so certain of the female and young, for these are always duller of colour, more olive, and without the bright black of the male. Moreover, the young male Orioles dress very much like their sisters until they are a year or two old, when they dress like a lord. Our neighbour of ours was sure she had discovered a new species hanging their nest under the awning of a window. Both birds were dull yellow, exactly similar in size and colour. There was no mistaking the Oriole's nest, however, and when we went to sea, we found the male to be an immature only, mating, as is their custom, the second year, before his best clothes arrive. The Baltimore Oriole attaches its nest or hammock to twigs pretty well up out of reach, and weaves the same of grasses and string or horsehairs, or all combined. Some of the strings and hairs are very long, and are passed back and forth in open-work fabric, crazy quilt fashion, and really very beautiful. The cradles swing with every passing breeze, suggesting the origin of the Indian lullaby song, rock baby in the tree-top. The eggs are four or five in number, bluish-white, with many and various markings in brown. These are laid on a soft bed of wool or other suitable material. No wind can blow the young from the nest, though sorry accidents do sometimes happen to them. We have found them caught by the toes in the meshes of the nest, helplessly suspended on the outside, thus earning the name of hangbird in a particular case. Not so very different from the Baltimore is the Bullock Oriole, which was also named for an English gentleman who discovered the gay fellow up in a tree, laughing at him. There is less black on the head and neck of the Bullock than on the Baltimore, but the two relatives are alike in habits and manners. The hooded Oriole differs from both the others in the fact that he wears a hood or cowl of yellow falling over the face like a mask. Perhaps the bill is more slender and decurved than in the bullock. The orchard oriole differs from the others in lacking the bright orange or yellow with the black of his dress. His bright chestnut breast, however, with the pointed bill and familiar manners, distinguish him as a member of the family. The nest is more compact than that of the others, woven sometimes of green grasses, which mature into sweet-smelling hay, retaining the green tint, which helps to hide its exact location in the foliage where it is placed. To know one member of the Oriole family is to know them all in a sense, and to know them is to love them. Here in Southern California, we are best acquainted with the Arizona Hooded, which comes to us from Mexico as early as March or April, and remains until autumn. We have also the Bullock, and have watched both at nesting time. None of the Orioles is gregarious. They come in single file, never in flocks, and go the same way, often a solitary bachelor or maid lingering behind. When they come in spring, it is always the male first, two or three days ahead of his mate, and only one male appears first on the grounds, who makes known his presence exultantly as if declaring, I've come, see me! The oranges are ripe about this time, and the coat of the gay bird is quite in keeping with the prevailing colour. One associates any of the orioles, save the orchard, with oranges and buttercups and dandelions and summer golden rod. These birds love the habitation of man, and where encouraged and tempted by fruits, remain about our homes by choice, returning each year to the old homestead. We have had Orioles return to our home four consecutive seasons, weaving the new nests on to last year's, like a lean-to, sewing the two together with threads. Three pairs of these double apartment nests are swinging from a single gum tree, 25 feet above the driveway. Often a pair of Orioles will suspend their hammocks under the cloth awnings of windows, if provision is made for them. A strong string or little rope, 
put in and out of the cloth, close up under the corner, will tempt them. We have not known an oriole to pierce firm, untransparent texture of any sort with her needle beak. On this account, we tempt her with the rope. If corn leaves were high enough, the orioles would doubtless take them for nesting places in their season. Not so very different from corn is our banana leaf, only a good deal broader and higher. It closes in the middle of the day like a corn leaf, opening again at night or with the sunset. When the orioles first come to us in the spring, they examine all the banana leaves. They soon make up their minds that these are either too young and tender or too old and tattered for a nesting site and resort to the trees. Any tree will answer, but a favourite is the blue gum, whose extreme height offers inducements. Though why the birds should take height into consideration we do not know, for later, when the leaves have matured, they select a low banana stock with its broad leaf, so low the hand can reach it. It may be they learn confidence as the season advances. We have seen no nests with us made of other material than the light yellow fibre which the birds strip from the edge of the palm leaves, the identical leaf of which the big broad fans are made. When the leaf is green, it drips small threads from the edge of its midribs, which you see in the fan as thick grooves. These threads the orioles may be seen pulling out or off any hour of the day if the nest be located in a tree. If they have found a suitable banana leaf, they work only in the morning and evening, as the leaf folds up like a book in the daytime, and the sharp apex under which the nest cuddles is difficult to reach. An oriole works only from below, pushing the thread up, and pulling it down the width of two or three veins away from the first stitch, making a good hold. She first leaves a dozen or twenty threads swinging, after doubling her stitches to make them fast. Then she ties and twists the ends of the threads together at suitable length and width for the inner lining of the hammock, thus fashioning the inner space first and adding to the outside. When the hole is completed, she lines it with soft materials, using but one kind of material in the same lining. The banana leaf hammock has two openings, back and front, through either of which the birds enter or emerge. As the nest progresses in size, the leaf is spread apart, until on completion, the thick midrib passes directly over the nest and fixes the shape of the hole like a roof or a tent. It is cool and always swinging, and on the whole is an ideal nursery. The adaptation of the oriole's feet for clinging and perching is a good thought of nature, else the bird could never weave from below as she does. She sticks her sharp toes through the mesh of the leaf, clinging to a rib while she works. This custom of beginning on the inside of the nest marks the building instincts of all the hangbirds, for should they reverse the order, they would make a mere tangle without inside proportions. It would be impossible to weave from without. As the nest progresses, the outer threads are coarser and less closely woven, brought together at certain points of attachment to the twig or the leaf rib, and making a nest the winds might play with, but not steal away. The oriole's nest is the poetry of bird architecture, be it swung in an apple tree, or an elm, or a maple, or under a leaf. Her slender beak is her needle, her shuttle her hands, her one means of livelihood. We may call her fabric a tangle if we will. To the eye of Mother Nature, it is a texture surpassing human ingenuity, the art for making which has descended by instinct to all her family. It is as beautiful as seaweed, as intricate as the network of a foxglove leaf, and suggests the infinite strands of a lacework spider's cocoon. All homage to the oriole. What a piece of good fortune it is that they come faithfully back to us every May. No matter how far in the winter they roam, they are sure to return to their summer home. What money could buy such a suit as this? What music can match that voice of his? 
and who such a quaint little house could build to be with a beautiful family filled oh happy winds that shall rock them soft in their swinging cradle hung high aloft oh happy leaves that the nest shall screen and happy sunbeams that steal between celia thaxter end of chapter 6「Chapter Seven of Birds of Song and Story. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. Birds of Song and Story by Elizabeth and Joseph Grinnell. Chapter Seven The Biography of a Canary Bird sing away i sing away merry little bird always gayest of the gay though a woodland roundelay you ne'er sung nor heard though your life from youth to age passes in a narrow cage near the window wild birds fly trees are waving round fair things everywhere you spy through the glass panes mystery your small life's small bound Nothing hinders your desire but a little gilded wire. Mrs. Crake He didn't look very much like a bird, being mostly a big little stomach, as bare of feathers as a beech nut just out of the burr, with here and there on the head and back a tuft of down. His eyelids bulged prominently, but did not open, sight being unnecessary in consideration of the needs of his large stomach said needs were partially satisfied every few minutes with the nursing bottle and a very primitive nursing bottle it was being no other than the beak of the parent bird thrust far down the little throat as is the family custom of the rest of the finches from somewhere in the breast of the mother a supply was always forthcoming and found its way down the tiny throat of the baby and into the depths of its pudgy being this food, which was moist and smooth, was very nourishing indeed, and sweet as well, for it tasted good, and left such a relish in the mouth that said mouth always opened of itself when the mother bird came near. But no more than its own share of the victuals did Dicky get, though he did his very best to have it all. There were other babies in the same cradle to be looked after and fed, and they all five were as much alike as five peas excepting that dicky was the smallest of all and was kept pushed well down in the bottom of the nest this did not prevent his mother from noticing his open mouth when it came his turn to be fed canary mothers have sharp eyes so have canary fathers as will be seen now when this particular pair of birds began to look about the cage for a good place to fix upon for family affairs some kind hand from outside fastened a little round basket in one corner exactly of the right sort to stimulate nesting business it was an old-fashioned basket with open-work sides and bottom airy and clean now had this basket been a box instead we should have had no tragedy to record or had the mesh been closely woven no fatal mistake though well meant would have darkened the sky of this domestic affair but alas the truth must be told since the biography we are writing admits of no reservations it all came about by the interference of the father bird whose presence in the nursery should have been forbidden at the start the mother was more than once alarmed by his activity and misapplied zeal about the nest and she had scolded him away with emphatic tones not having anything of importance to do save to eat all day and sleep all night he was on the alert for employment one dreadful morning when the mother was attending to breakfast this father canary espied some tatters sticking out of the bottom meshes of the nest basket bits of string ends and threads carelessly and innocently overlooked ah thought he here is something that ought to be attended to at once and he went to work 
he thrust his sharp beak up between the round meshes of the basket bottom and pulled at every thread he could lay hold of struggling beneath fairly losing his foothold in his eagerness to pull them out having succeeded in dragging most of the material from beneath the birdlings he caught sight of a few more straight pink strings lying across the meshes and began tugging at them the mother feeding the babies from the edge of the nest above noticed the little ones each in its turn crouching farther and farther into the bottom of the cradle faintly opening their mouths as if to cry but being too young and weak to utter a sound it was a mystery but the deepest mystery of it all was the fact that little dicky the dwarf of the family came to the top as the rest worked down and was getting more than his share of the breakfast about this time the mistress of the canary cage came to see after her pets and beheld a sight which made her scream as hard as if she had seen a mouse there beneath the nest was the father bird tugging at protruding feet and legs of baby birds with all his might growing more and more excited as he saw his supposed strings resisting his attempts to pull them through when the affair was looked into there was but one bird left alive of the five little infants no more than five days old and they were released from their predicament to have a decent burial in the garden at the foot of a motherly-looking cabbage-head that stood straight up in disgust of the cruel affair as if she would ever have such a thing happen to her little cabbages true she had no little cabbages of her own but that made no difference now that we have tucked away these four little canary birds who never saw the light of day and therefore never could realize what they missed by not holding on harder to what little they had by way of feet and legs we will drop the painful subject and attend to dicky of course the father bird was excluded from the nursery as he should have been weeks before and there was only one mouth to feed and that mouth was never empty unless the owner of it was sleeping in fact the babe was stuffed though strange to say his stomach grew no bigger but less and less as the rest of his body filled out at the end of a couple of weeks he had a pretty fair shirt on his back of delicate down softer than any shirt of wool that ever warmed a human baby's body and the mother stood on the edge of the basket and admired it she didn't make it of course but she was in some way responsible for it and no doubt felt proud of the bit of fancy work she noticed also that the eyes of the little one did not bulge so much as they did and a tiny slit appeared at the centre widening slowly until one happy hour they opened fairly out and the baby had eyes but they were tired eyes to start with like the eyes of most young things and they wearied with just a glimpse of the light so the lids closed and it was several days before dicky actually took in the situation as he ought there being no other baby to crowd he kept to the nest longer than birds commonly do and when at last he got on his feet he was pretty well fledged now when he had obtained his first youthful suit of clothes his mother looked surprised as did also his father it is to be supposed he in his solitary cage hanging close to the other both parent birds were pure-bred tenerife canaries the male as green as emerald and the female more dusky and lighter by a strange freak of nature which happens sometimes by breeding these birds in captivity the young fellow was bright yellow of the tint of a ripe lemon beak white and eye black while his feet and ankles retained their original baby pinkness oh he was a pretty bird but it was foreordained in his case as in similar cases that he should not be so sweet a singer as though his colour had been like that of his parents he was not conscious of this fact however and it mattered not to him that he was yellow instead of green 
nor did he care in the least that the price of him was marked down to a dollar and a half when it should have been double away he went in a new cage after his new mistress had paid the sum named into the hand of his former owner he peeked out of the bars as he was carried along swinging at every step that is he peeped out as well as he could considering that a cloth was covered over the cage the wind blew the cloth aside now and then and dicky saw wonderful sights sights that were familiar and so soul appealing not that he in his own short life had ever seen such sights but that somehow in his little being were vague memories or conceptions of what his ancestors had seen it is hard to explain it but everything cannot be explained when we come to one of these things we call it instinct with a wise shake of our heads just as we were told to say jerusalem when we came to a word we couldn't pronounce when we were very young and read in the second reader well dicky had a good home of his own and lived for a purpose although he never developed into a trained singer in the heart of him he longed for a mate and often expressed his desires in low musical notes but no mate came to him and he would sit for hours pondering on his bachelor's lot and singing more notes now wild birds are constantly having something happen to them they fly against a wire or get a wing hurt or the young fall out of the nest and can't find their mother Dickie's mistress was always on the lookout for such accidents, and she brought such birds into the house and nursed them, and brought them back to health when possible. It occurred to her to offer a calling or vocation to Dickie, so she made a small private hospital of his cage, into which she placed the victims of accident or sickness as she found them. Dickie was surprised, never having seen a bird save his parents, and his lady-love in his dreams, and at first he stood on tiptoe and was frightened. But he learned to be kind after a while, and to show his visitors where the food and water were kept, and to snuggle up to them on the perch when it came bedtime. Many and many a poor invalid did he aid in restoring to freedom and flight, until he became pretty well acquainted with the birds that nest in our grounds. Year after year the good work went on, and Dickie developed more musical talent, until he sang sweetly, imitating the finches and linnets outside. In the fall of the year, when the wild birds were thinking of their annual migrations, Dickie himself grew restless and quit his songs, then his mistress opened his door and told him he might go not far away of course but all about in the room that seemed to this caged bird as big as any world could be in his quest for new nooks he came by accident upon the mirror above the fireplace standing on the edge of a little vase before the glass just in front of the beveled edge of it he espied two yellow birds one in the glass itself and another in the beveled edge as a strict law of science had determined should be the case in a second the whole bearing of the bird was changed his feathers lay close his legs stood long and slim and his eyes bulged as they never had bulged since the lids parted when he was two weeks old then he found voice he sang as never a green bird sang sweeter he turned his head and the two birds in the glass turned their heads he preened his wing and the two birds preened each a wing his little throat swelled out in melody the tip of his beak pointing straight to the ceiling of the big room as if it were indeed the blue sky and the two birds sang with uplifted beaks and swelling throats they were of his own kind his own race his own ancestral comrades and they were not green the low mesas of the canary islands never resounded to such melody but melody was not food at least so thought dicky's mistress as she tempted the bird in vain to eat 
not a crumb would he touch until placed back in his cage where he straightway forgot his recent discoveries as usual he took his bread and cookie to the water dish and set it to soak for dinner and scattered his seeds about the cage floor in his eagerness to dispose of the non-essentials the hemp only being in his opinion suitable for his needs of course he was obliged to pick up his crumbs after he had thus assorted the varieties every day when the door was open he flew straight to the mirror if we moved the vase to the middle away from the beveled edge he found the place by himself and stood on tiptoe exactly where the reflection accorded him the companionship of two birds and he would resume his melody it was real to him this comradeship and it lasted until actual and personally responsible companions were provided for him now let not the reader conjure up a picture of many birds in a cage with dicky as governor or presiding elder it was midsummer when the sands are hot and inviting to the retiring and modest family known by name as lizards the particular branch of this family to which we refer and to which dicky was referred is known to scientists who would be precise of expression as gerhonitus but the familiar name of lizard is sufficient for the creatures we placed in a large wire cage on the upper balcony and designed for dicky's summer companions now it should not seem strange to any one that we chose the lizard people to associate with this yellow-as-gold canary were they not one and the same long ages ago and this is no legend but fact have they not both to this day scales on their legs and a good long backbone to be sure the birds now have feathers on most of their bodies so they may be able to fly but a long while ago the bird had only scales and not a single feather and are not baby lizards hatched from eggs laid by the mother lizard ah it is a long story this dating back too far to count but long stories are quite the accepted fashion in natural science and from reading them we resolve to make some observations of our own there is more to be gained sometimes in making observations on one's own account than by adopting those of others we captured half a dozen lizards and gave them the names of lizbeth liza liz and lees that is four of them being of the same order received these names there were two little ones besides with peacock blue trimmings which have nothing to do with this story the four named were about eight inches in length speckled above and silver beneath their other beauties and characteristics will not be discussed except as it becomes necessary in treating of dicky's further development from the day when these five creatures became fellow captives they were friends the lizards took to sleeping in the canary's food box so that in getting at his meals he was obliged to peck between them and sometimes to step over them and crowd them with his head after hidden seeds as the afternoon sunshine slanted across the cage the five took their dry bath all in a heap bird on top with wings outspread lizards in a tangle each and all thankful that there was such a thing as a sun-bath or family descent later as the sun was going down and the lizards became drowsy as lizards will dicky sang them a low lullaby now on the perch above them now on the rim of the feed-box at times another comrade joined them especially at this choral hour one of those red and white striped snakes seen in ferns and brakes along water courses made a home in the cage with the bird and the lizards this snake had an ear for music at the first notes he emerged from his lair slowly and cautiously lifted his graceful head toward the singer and glided in his direction if the bird were on the perch, the snake would crawl up the end posts, taking hold with his scales, 
which of course were his feet, and lie at length on the perch at Dickie's feet, watching out of its beautiful eyes. At other times it would merely glide toward the bird, lift its head erect some five or six inches, and remain motionless until the song was finished. A big warty hop-toad, also an inmate of this asylum, was a friend of Dickie's, as indeed was every creature, even to the big grasshopper. This toad and the bird were often seen in the bath together, the toad simply squatting, as is the custom of toads, the bird splashing and spattering the water over everything, including, of course, the toad. The toad blinked and squatted flatter to the bottom of the bath, hopping out when the bird was done and the two sunning themselves after nature's own way of using a bath towel it would be too long a story were one to tell of the songs dicky sang to the drone of the drones bumming away against the wire sorry perhaps that they were to become dinner to lizards before summer was half over but we must bring the biography to an end hoping that these few reminiscences will tend to interest people in the dickies that are about them in wire cages too often neglected and never half comprehended but we should by all means give an account of the last we ever saw of this particular dicky during his stay on the balcony he had become acquainted with the finches and linnets and mockingbirds of the yard, holding quiet talks with them in the twilight, and growing more thoughtful at times, even to the extent of watching for opportunities to escape. One evening, just as we lifted the door to set in a fresh pan of water, out darted Dicky. Straight to a tree nearby he flew and called himself over and over again. We cried to him, "Dicky, oh, Dicky, come back! Ah, but here was a taste of freedom, the freedom which his ancestral relatives had enjoyed on the low slopes of Tenerife, before ever a foreign ship had carried them away captive. And Dicky had never read a word about his ancestors and their freedom. Therefore, what did he know about it? scientists call it instinct it is a word too hard for us and we will say jerusalem and let it pass away across the street flew dicky the bird of prison birth the bird of only two comrades of his kind and colour and these but shadows in a mirror the lizards heard us call and peeped lazily over the edge of the hammock seed box blinking sleepily and then cuddled down again without sense of their loss. Running after the bird did not bring him back, as everybody knows to his sorrow who has once tried it. A glint of gold in the pine tree, a radiance as of lemon streamers in and out of the cypress hedge, and we saw Dicky no more. My bird has flown away, far out of sight has flown I know not where. Look in your lawn, I pray ye maidens kind and fair and see if my beloved bird be there find him but do not dwell with eyes too fond on the fair form you see nor love his song too well send him at once to me or leave him to the air and liberty from the spanish some day a budding ornithologist more eager than wise with notebook and pencil will possibly record a new species among the foothill trees a species that resembles both yellow warbler and goldfinch and the young man will look very knowing all alone out in the woods and he will send his specimen to the national museum for identification and the museum people will shake their wiser heads and inform the ornithologist that in their opinion there is more of the ordinary tame canary let loose in the individual than goldfinch or warbler let it pass a bird for thee in silken bonds i hold whose yellow plumage shines like polished gold from distant isles the lovely stranger came and bears the far away canary's name littleton end of section seven chapter seven the biography of a canary bird
Chapter 8 of Birds of Song and Story. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. Birds of Song and Story by Elizabeth and Joseph Grinnell. Chapter 8 Sparrows and Sparrows. What is it then to be a queen? if it is not like the silver linden tree to cast a protecting shadow over the world's sweetest songbirds, Carmen Silver. Grudge not the wheat which hunger forces birds to eat, your blinded eyes worst foes to you, cannot see the good which sparrows do, did not poor birds with watching rounds pick up the insects from your grounds, did they not tend your rising grain, you then might sow to reap in vain? John Clare No bird, unless it be the crow, is so nicknamed as the sparrow. None is so evil spoken of, none so loved. Accepted enemy of the farmer, it is the farmer's dearest friend. It is a good large family, that of the sparrows, ninety or more varieties occurring in the United States. Always, of whatever tint or markings, it is recognised by its stout, stalky shape, short legs and strong feet, but more surely by its bulging, cone-like bill, pointed toward the end. This beak is the bird's best characteristic, just as a certain nose is the leading feature of some human families. And there is character in a sparrow's nose. It is used for original research and investigation, on account of which the sparrow, of all the birds, deserves the degree of Doctor of Philosophy conferred upon him, omitting, of course, one single member of the family, the English sparrow. And why the English sparrow should come in for any notice among the songbirds we cannot tell, unless it be the fact that it really does haunt them, and they have to put up with it almost everywhere they go. Surely it needs no picture to introduce this little vagrant, save in a few regions sacred as yet from its presence. Even this little foreign rogue has lovable traits, were it not for the prejudice against him. What persistence he has in the face of persecution and death! What philosophy in the production of large families to compensate for loss! What domestic habits! What accommodation to circumstances! What cheerful acceptance of his lot! Surely the English sparrow presents an example worthy of imitation. To those whose preferences are for cooked little birds, what suggestions are stirred by the hosts of these sparrows invitingly arrayed on roof and porch and fences? They make as good pot pie as the bobolink or robin, and it would seem less sacrilege to so appropriate them. The rich and poor alike might indulge in the delicacy especially might the weak little starvelings in the cities, whose dipper of fresh new milk is long in coming, or never to come at all, find in sparrow broth a nourishing substitute. Who knows but for this very purpose the birds are sent to the large cities? We read of a story of quails in a certain old book, and more than half believe the wonderful tale. Why not make a modern story of sparrows sent on purpose? and cultivate a taste for the little sinner, and its eggs. Why, a sparrow hen will lay on indefinitely like a real biddy, only to be sure to respect the nest egg, so the old bird may have one always by her, to measure by. Think of the little mothers of the big cities, raising baby weaklings on sparrow broth and poached sparrow's eggs. It is a pity to waste such fat little scraps of meat as are thrown about. Besides, making good use of the birds, if they must be killed, is good for the soul of boys. It would teach them thrift and a good purpose. Our best ornithologists declare the English sparrow a nuisance without a redeeming quality. Pity they hadn't thought about the pie. But there are sparrows and sparrows. Some of the family are our sweetest singers. Take the song sparrow the bird of the silver tongue. It is known throughout the eastern United States and Canada, and on the Pacific coast and elsewhere, it is still the song sparrow, though it varies slightly in colour in different regions. 
In many states it remains all winter, singing when the snow is falling, and keeping comradeship with the chickadee. Everybody knows the little fellow by his voice, if not by his coat. Nothing fine about the coat or gown, save its modest tints. But, as with many another bird of grey or brown plumage, its song is the sweetest. Hearty, limpid, cheerful in the saddest weather, always ending in the melody of an upward inflection, as if he invited answer. The song sparrow is the only one we have noticed to gargle the song in its throat, swallowing a few drops with each mouthful. Or it may be that he stops to take a breath between notes. We have seen him sing, sprawled flat on a log in a hot day, with wings outspread and taking a sun bath. The song is always very brief, as if he would not tire his listeners, though he gives them an encore with hearty grace. Individual birds differ in song, no two singing their dozen notes exactly alike. While his mate is patiently waiting to get the best results from her four or five party-coloured eggs, the song sparrow sings constantly, never far from the nest in the bush or the low tree, or even on the ground, where cats are debarred from the vicinity. One can never depend on the exact colour of the eggs, for they vary in tint from greenish-white to browns and lavender, speckled or clouded, just as it happens. And the feathers of the birds have all these colours mingled and dotted and striped, and dashed off, as you may see for yourself, by looking out of the window or taking a still stroll down along the creek. The song sparrow has a pert little way of sticking its tail straight up like a wren when it runs, and it is always running about. In our grounds, they follow us like kittens, keeping up their happy chirp as if glad they ever lived and were blessed with feet and a beak. The nest of the song sparrow is compact and snug, with little loose material about the base of it. We have had a long hunt many a time to find it. If we are in the vicinity of it, the two birds follow us, chirping, never going straight to the nest, but wandering as we wander, picking up food in the way, and appearing to hold a chatty conversation. It is not evident that they are trying to conceal the fact that they have a nest and that we are near it, for if we sit down and wait, the mother goes straight to it without a sign of fear. But we must wait a long while sometimes until dinner is over, for these birds seem to remain away from the nest longer at a time than most birds do. They feed their young on larvae, pecked out of the loose earth, and tiny seeds from under the bushes, or soft buds that have fallen. They pick up a whole beakful, never being satisfied with the amount collected, so it drips from the corners of their mouths in an odd fashion, and some of it escapes, especially if it have feet of its own. We have not seen a nest of any other than a dark colour. Horse hairs make almost half of it, and the outside is of grass closely woven around. The young birds are not scared out of their wits, as are some birdlings, if a stranger appears, but will snuggle down and look one in the face. Once off and out, they are always hungry, following the parent birds with a merry chirp, with the usual upward inflection. They come early to our garden table, where crumbs of cake and other things tempt them to eat too much. After they are filled, they hop a few feet away and sit ruffled all up and blinking with satisfaction. Once we played a pretty trick on the sparrows, knowing their preference for sweets, we placed a saucer of black New Orleans molasses on the table with a few crumbs sprinkled on the top. Of course, the birds took the crumbs, and of course again they took a taste of the molasses. It wasn't a day before they dipped their beak into the molasses that had now no sprinkling of crumbs and seemed surprised at its lack of shape. It tasted good, and yet they couldn't pick it up like crumbs. Then they took to leaving the tip of the bill in the edge of it and swallowing like any person of sense. When they were done, they flew away with the molasses dripping from their faces and beaks in a laughable style, returning almost immediately with more birds. The fact is, a sparrow is a boy when it comes to eating. Were it not for its good appetite, it couldn't put up with just anything. 
Sparrows love the towns and cities because they find crumbs there. Our friend the baker knows them, and many a meal do they find ready spread at his back door. So does Bridget the cook, and even Lung Wo, if their hearts happen to have a soft place for the birds. As for the boy around the corner, who walks about on crutches, he knows all about the sparrow's preferences. In fact, sparrows seem to have a special liking for boys on crutches. One little fellow we knew used to lay his crutch down flat on the ground and place food up and down on it when the sparrows were hungry in the morning, and the crutch came to be the family board around which the birds gathered, be the crutch laid flat or tilted aslant on the doorstep. In this way, Johnny of the crippled foot came to have a good understanding with the birds, and many a quiet hour was spent in their company. Johnny may turn out to be a great ornithologist some day, all on account of his crutch. What will it matter that he may never shoulder a gun and wander off to the woods to shoot specimens? His knowledge of bird ways will serve a better purpose than a possible gun. It was Johnny who first told us to notice how a sparrow straddles his little stick legs far apart when he walks, spreading his toes in a comical way. Eastern and Western song sparrows differ, and so do individual birds everywhere, not only in their songs, but in the distribution of specks and stripes on their clothes. What we have said about our song sparrows may not wholly apply to the family elsewhere. These differences lead bird lovers to study each of the birds about his own door and forests, without placing too much credit upon what others say. There is much of the year when sparrows live almost solely on seeds, and this is the time when they join hands with the farmer, so to speak, and help him with the thistles and other weeds, by work at the seed tufts and pods. Sparrows love to run in and out of holes and cracks, and between corn stalks, and dry wood piles. It was this habit of peeping into everything, on the part of the birds, that led the olden poet to write, I love the sparrow's way to watch upon the cotter's sheds, so here and there pull out the thatch that they may hide their heads. It was a pretty idea and a charitable one, that of the poets. In a country where roofs are shingled with thatch, or dry sticks and leaves overlapping, the sparrows are familiar residents, and where somebody remembers to pull out the thatch, or make a loose little corner on purpose, they sleep all night. We have ourselves made many a pile of brush on purpose for the sparrows. The white-crowned sparrows winter with us, going far up the Alaskan coast to nest in the spring, as do the tree sparrow, the golden-crowned, savannah, and some others, including the beautiful fox sparrow. These birds arrive in the far north as soon as the rivers are open, and to the gold seekers who get to their dreary work with pick and spade are like friends from home. Many a homesick miner stops a moment to listen to their clear, ringing songs, almost always in the rising inflection, as if a question were asked. And for answer, the man who sometimes would give all the gold he ever saw for one glimpse of home draws his sleeve across his eyes. Some of the sparrows which nest in Alaska use pure white ptarmigan feathers for nest lining, while their cousins in the east, on the opposite side, breeding in Labrador, use eiderdown. In these far northern latitudes, these birds scratch in the moss and dead leaves of summertime, often coming to ice at the depth of three or four inches. The summers are so short that insect life is very scarce, excepting the mosquitoes. But there are berries, and an occasional hunter's or gold seeker's cabin always furnishes meals at short notice. Men may pass the birds at home in civilization with scarcely a thought, but when away and alone, the presence of a bird they have known in other climes brings them to their senses. It is then they recognize the fact that birds are their comrades and friends, to be cherished and fed, not always hunted and eaten. On account of the distribution of sparrows the world over, many legends have been written of them. The very earliest we have read is the one that assures us the sparrow was seen by Mother Eve in the Garden of Eden on the day she ate of the forbidden fruit. In fact, the tree 
was full of sparrows warning the woman not to eat, though the birds themselves were making for the fruit with might and main. In the story of Joseph, it is recorded that the chief baker had a dream. In his dream, he bore three baskets on his head. In the uppermost basket were all kinds of bake meats for the king. While the baker was walking to the palace with the baskets on his head, the sparrows came and ate all the meat there was in the upper basket. In the narrative, the name of the birds is not given, but the fact that they ate up all the meat, going in at the little wickerwork spaces, leads us to believe they were sparrows. It was only a dream, but people dream their waking thoughts and habits. It is supposed that this chief baker was fond of birds, and it was customary for him to feed them on the king's victuals. Well, the king is no poorer off now that the birds had their fill, and we wish peace to the soul of the baker for his kindness. In the ballad of the babes in the wood, it was the sparrow who made the fatal mistake which took off Cock Robin before the wedding feast was over. Poor sparrow! He has never been known to carry a bow and arrow under his coat from that day to this. Thinking of that old ballad, we have often watched the robins and the sparrows together and are never able to make out that the robin holds any grudge against his ancient friend and guest who made the blunder. In nearly all the markets of the old world, sparrows have been sold as food, bringing the very smallest price imaginable. In Palestine, two of them were sold for the least piece of money in use, though what anybody wants of two sparrows, unless to make a baby's meal, we do not know. The tree sparrow of England is common in the Holy Land, and it was probably this bird to which the New Testament alludes. Of our American sparrows, the fox sparrow is probably the most beautiful in markings. By its name, one might imagine it had something to do with foxes, and so it has, but in colour only, being a rich foxy brown in its darker tints. This bird is seen all winter in Washington on the Capitol grounds, scratching in the leaves for food, and singing its loyal melody. The fox sparrow has been sometimes detained in captivity, but as a rule grows too fat for a good singer. It seems to be the same with them as with our domestic fowls. If too fat, they give poor returns. The hen and the sparrow, and most people must scratch for a living, would they make a success in life. But who would want to cage a sparrow unless it be an invalid who can never go out of the room? Even here, if the invalid have a window sill, it were better, for the window sill is sparrow's own delight, if it be furnished with crumbs. Or, if one would see some fun, let the crumbs be in a good round loaf, tightly fastened. This, let the sparrow understand, is for him alone, and he will burrow to the heart of it. Caged birds make sorry companions. The farmer sometimes wishes he had all the sparrows he ever saw in a cage. Well, farmer, were it not for the sparrows, there would be more abandoned farms than you can imagine. Therefore, let them live and have their freedom, and let the farmer's daughter make bread on purpose for them. They will make no complaints about her first attempts, nor call it sour or heavy. Let the children play at campfire and throw their biscuits to the birds. It will give them happy hearts each of them, the birds and the children. The sparrows will respond with a single word of thanks, but it will be hearty. One syllable clear and soft as a raindrop's silvery patter, or a tinkling fairy bell heard aloft in the midst of the merry chatter of robin and linnet and wren and jay, one syllable oft repeated, he has but a single word to say, and of that he will not be cheated. End of chapter 8。Chapter 9 of Birds of Song and Story。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. Birds of Song and Story by Elizabeth and Joseph Grinnell Chapter 9 The Story of the Summer Yellowbird 
the little bird sits at his door in the sun a tilt like a blossom among the leaves and lets his illumined being o'errun with the deluge of summer it receives his mate feels the eggs beneath her wings and the heart in her dumb breast flutters and sings he sings to the wide world and she to her nest in the nice ear of nature which song is the best james russell lowell here is a legend of the summer yellow bird let who will believe or disbelieve they will think of it as often as they see the yellow beauty once on a time when mother nature was very lavish of her gold she forgot to be thrifty and took to spreading it everywhere she thought she had enough to make the whole world yellow this being her favorite color but she soon collected her wits and reasoned that if everything were yellow there would be nothing left for contrast so she quit spreading it on and took to tossing it about in great glee not caring where it went so it was in dashes and dots and streaks and lumps here and there she threw whole handfuls on the flowers and butterflies and little worms and toadstools and grass roots and up in the sky at sunset and against mountain peaks the mountains laughed at this sudden whim of mother nature opening their mouths wide and got whole apronfuls tossed right down their throats after the ocean bottoms had been peppered with the gold the flowers came along for their share the buttercups and dandelions and goldenrod and sunflowers and jonquils and hosts of others last came the orioles and finches and bobolinks and many others each in turn getting a spray or a dash or a grain of the yellow and went away singing about it but certain very plain little birds arrived later when the gold was almost gone and asked nature to give them just a little now she had but a handful left seeing that there wasn't enough to go around if each had a little the lady birds said give all you have left to our mates we do not care for gold we will follow them about like shadows and look well to the nesting then nature smiled on the unselfish lady birds and tossed all she had left of the yellow stuff straight at the singers who stood before her each behind the other in a straight row thinking she would give it to them in bits but nature threw it at them with all her might laughing of course the bird in front got the biggest splash and then it scattered down the line until the last few had only a dust or two but they all began to warble every one each so happy that he had a little gold when nature saw that the bird in the front had more than his share she looked very keenly in his face and said my son you must go everywhere all over the cities and towns and country and forests wherever human hearts are sad and eyes are dim with tears and you must warble all about summer and good times when the clouds are dark and you must be fond of houses where people dwell and fields and playgrounds and sheep and keep company with sorrow and make the earth glad you had so much gold about you and you can stay out in the rain and make believe the sun shines when it doesn't just to make people happier shoo little summer yellow bird that is your name and the bird has been true to his happy mission ever since going about here and there and everywhere in our country taking his gold with him and making buttercups and dandelions grow on fir trees and goldenrod quiver in the glens before even the spring crocuses are out in the green of the trees he looks like a single nugget and when he runs up and down a branch it seems as if somebody had spilled liquid gold above and it was running zigzag in and out of the bark when he flies in the blue sky he seems like a visible laugh for nobody can see the dash he makes and not smile 
many a breaking heart has been made less sad by the sight of him and though he is not much of a singer as singing goes the few notes he has are cheery better to speak a few glad words than be an orator and scold and the yellow summer bird couldn't scold if he tried the more he warbles gladness the more the habit grows in those nooks where the yellow warbler does his dress act or moults the children catch the feathers as they fall from his night perch or lie in the ferns and toss them about for fun to see them glint in the sunshine little girls gather them for doll hats and make startling fashions for winter headdresses all right little girls take the feathers as they are tossed to you by the merry warbler without a single twinge of conscience they are yours because they are given you you didn't steal them nor hire a big boy to bring them to you should the yellow warbler molt a pair of wings by mistake and you found them lying in a bush some bright autumn morning you might have them for your doll's hat you might even put them on your own little head but to rob a bird of its gold to tear out a wing or a feather to flaunt on your own pitiless head or the cracked china head of your doll that would be a different thing there is a story afloat which we are tempted to tell though it isn't a very happy one and is not believed by everybody it especially concerns girls and some women it has been a well-known fact for centuries that birds do hold conventions for the supposed purpose of talking over matters that concern themselves not long ago some time in the century that has just passed there was a general convention of american birds held in the backwoods of the north there were representatives from all the bird families that wear bright feathers the purpose of the assembly was for discussion of different points in fashion more particularly of the headdress of women now at this point in the story everybody knows exactly the drift of the moral which is as sure to come at the end as the yellow bird is sure to come with the daffodils so it's of no use to go on with the story since the moral is what storytellers usually aim at from start to finish listen to the summer yellow bird all next season and when he gives the word let everybody big and little who loves to wear bird feathers and wings make a scramble for the backwoods and you may hear the upshot of the convention for yourself in the meantime should crows and magpies and eagles and vultures and other birds of strong beak and furious temper steal down on homes and peck off the scalps of girls and women as they lie in their happy beds let no one be alarmed possibly there has been a bird convention and the big birds of sharp claw and strong beak are but doing as they are directed and it is the fashion for them to do it so they are quite excusable but if we go on with legends and imagined bird conventions we shall never get to the bird itself the bird itself is the summer yellow bird the dear delightful yellow warbler whose very picture you see before you the restless much-travelled bird the bird who may not look exactly like himself when his coat is worn and tumbled but who comes by a new fresh one when it is most sorely needed more dull of colour is his mate who is just behind himself somewhere in the tree out of range of the camera the two are never far apart in family times where one flies there goes the other happy as clams if clams ever are very happy which we doubt nesting as they do deep down in the wet sand and never seeing a flower or a ripe peach or a raspberry all their lives however it is supposed the clam knows something akin to happiness for he is always where he wants to be 
save when he falls into the pot, and here is where we will leave him. Well, the yellow warbler is at home all over North America, migrating from place to place, sometimes in twos and threes, sometimes in flocks, at times journeying straight on, and again stopping in every treetop for refreshments sure to be ready. Sometimes the birds travel by night, coming in on the morning train like any travelers, hungry for breakfast and the first we know of their arrival is a quaint little plea for something to eat. Not a highly melodious note that, but curious and pleasing. We always know summer is coming straight away when we see the warbler, just as we know winter is here by the first snowflake, and as soon as they arrive nesting begins. For that very purpose they come, of course. As to the nests, they are very beautiful. The one in the picture must have been built deep in the woods, where grasses and dried leaf tatters were plenty. But there is no set pattern to go by when nests are made. That is, there is no particular building material allowed, as with the swallows and some others. The yellow warbler loves best to use things that mat together readily, so the nest cup will be compact and thick, like a piece of felt cloth, so different from the nest of the grosbeak, transparent and open like basket work. To get this cloth like substance, the birds visit the sweet fern stalks of the pasture sides, pulling off the woolly furs bit by bit until a beakful is gathered. Then they make a trip to the brooks, especially in early spring, where they wake up the catkins on the pussy willows and get loads of the soft fur. Oh, the secrets the pussy willows know about bird and bat and butterfly cocoon and other winged people that frolic in their shadows. They could tell you exactly how many beakfuls of pussy fur it takes to weave a crib blanket for a yellow warbler's nest. Whole nests are made of it sometimes, for the warbler loves to gather one particular kind of material for a nest if she comes across enough of it in one spot. That is why they build so rapidly, always getting it done in a hurry. They love big loads of anything, and the male shows his mate where she can find it with the least trouble. In places where sheep pasture, rubbing against trees, and catching their sides into thorns and sticks at every turn, the yellow bird gathers the wool. She likes this particularly, as it is light and clings to itself, and she can carry large quantities at one trip. The happy boy or girl who has a pasture nearby home is rich. There is nothing like a pasture to study nature in, especially birds. A woodlot with trees of all sizes in it, a cranberry bog, a huckleberry patch, a maple grove, a sweet fern corner with snake vines running at random among young brakes. Ah, this is the spot of all the world for nature lovers and birds. One can part the bushes and find a warbler's nest most anywhere. One can peer up into the treetops and find another. In the treetops the nest is fastened securely, be it where the winds have a habit of blowing through their fingers when it isn't necessary. But birds and winds are fair playfellows and seldom interfere with one another. Here in Southern California we have little wind, if any, in the days of the summer yellowbird. So nests are often set in a crotch without a bit of fastening. Two years ago a pair came to the house grounds, the first we had seen so near. We wondered what they would nest with first, knowing their disposition to take the material close at hand. We knew they stripped the down from the backs of the sycamores in the mountain cannons, and gather bits of wool fiber from tree trunks, or ravel lint from late weed stems in the arroyos. So we anticipated and shook loose cotton batting in a bush. 
no sooner did father yellowbird spy the fluffy white stuff than he brought madam and she was delighted this cotton could be pulled by beakfuls and an afternoon or two would make the entire nest and they used it not getting another thing save some gray hairs from a lady's head which in combing had escaped and were saved on purpose for the birds the nest was placed in the crotch of a pepper tree just out of reach of tiptoe inquirers just one pinch of cotton above another until the cup was deep and true to the shaping of the mother's breast she turning round and round after the manner of nest builders through the layers ran separate hairs which held the cotton in shape it was a beautiful thing that nest even after it had served its purpose and we took it down when the birds had flown that was a mistake of ours it was before we had come to know it is better to leave old nests undisturbed many birds love to return the coming season and repair last year's structures when the following summer came and the yellow birds returned from their winter in mexico they went straight to the same old tree they crept up and down the trunk peering into all the crotches and criticizing every place where a nest might have been perhaps a single speck of the cotton had remained and served for a pointer anyway the birds located the exact spot and went to work without more ado exactly as though they remembered they went also to the supply counter where we had placed more cotton in advance of their coming and with it they built exactly the same white nest in the very crotch of last year's happy history it was a pretty sight to see the mother take the cotton it looked sparklingly white against her breast and dripping from her beak and all the time she was arranging it in the nest to suit her experienced mind her mate sang warbling his sympathy darting through the leaves and running up and down the branches this running up and down the boughs so like their cousins the creepers makes this bird look graceful of form and motion as indeed he is anywhere and at anything he does on this account he is often called the gem bird his brilliant grace suggesting some precious and coveted stone these warblers of ours did not feign lameness if we came near the nest as some of the family are said to do from daily companionship they came to know and trust us had the nest been a little lower we should have succeeded in taming them completely as we have many of the wild birds at nesting time we have left the nest where it is this fall hoping the birds will return and claim it in another year it being of cotton however and having no threads to bind it in the crotch we think the winter storms will wreck it it has been claimed by good authority that the cowbird loves to deposit her eggs in the yellow warbler's nest but this is of little avail to the cowbird's trick for madame warbler sees the point and the egg at a glance she often builds above the intruder imprisoning the alien egg and so leaves it to its fate a single bird is said to have built above the cowbird's egg three times in succession as the intruder persisted until there were four floors to the nest on the last of which the mother succeeded in laying her own eggs if she becomes discouraged by the persistency of her guilty neighbor she will leave the spot sometimes and search for another in which to carry on her own affairs in peace of the seventy-five or more species of this warbler family said to occur in the united states all resemble each other in points enough to mark them as warblers all are insect eaters some are called worm eaters others bug eaters they despise a vegetable diet 
on account of their sharp appetite for grubs and larvae the warblers are the friends of all who live by the growth of green things and the ripening of fruits and grains with few exceptions all the birds are small and very beautiful theirs is the second largest family among our birds ranking next to the sparrows some of the warblers live near streams playing boat on floating driftwood hunting for insects in the decaying timbers running up and down half-submerged logs atilt on the shore after spiders and water beetles if they are missed we may be sure they will return in their own good time bringing their warble with them they may only stay long enough for breakfast or dinner taking advantage of their stop-over tickets like any travellers of note perhaps the strong courageous singing males of the party of travellers come in advance of the females and young as if to see that the country is ready and at peace nothing can be said of them more beautiful and fitting than this quotation from eliot coos with tireless industry do the warblers defend the human race they visit the orchard when the apple and pear the peach plum and cherry are in bloom seeming to revel among the sweet-scented blossoms but never faltering in their good work they peer into crevices of the bark and explore the very heart of the buds to detect drag forth and destroy those tiny creatures which prey upon the hopes of the fruit grower and which if undisturbed would bring all his care to naught some warblers flit incessantly in the tops of the tallest trees others hug close to the scored trunks and gnarled boughs of the forest kings some peep from the thickets and shrubbery that deck the water courses playing at hide-and-seek others more humble still descend to the ground where they glide with pretty mincing steps and affected turning of the head this way and that their delicate flesh-tinted feet just stirring the layer of withered leaves with which a past season carpeted the sod we may see warblers everywhere in their season and find them a continual surprise sweet and true are the notes of his song sweet and yet always full and strong true and yet they are never sad serene with that peace that maketh glad life 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 oh what a blessing is life life is glad End of section nine chapter nine Chapter ten of Birds of Song and Story. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Birds of Song and Story by Elizabeth and Joseph Grinnell. Chapter ten The Bluebird. He flits through the orchard, he visits each tree, the red flowering peach and the apple sweet blossoms. He snaps up destroyers wherever they be, and seizes the caitiffs that lurk in their blossoms. He drags the vile worm from the corn it devours, the worms from their webs where they riot and welter. His song and his services freely are ours, and all that he asks is in summer a shelter. Wilson Yesterday the snow melted from the top of the great rocks in the woods. The evergreens shading the rocks lost their white load that had been bearing down the branches for a month. The fences straggled their lean legs, wide apart, as if it were summer, only the tips of their toes resting on the surface snow. The north roof of the barn fringed itself with icicles that tumbled down by noon, sticking up at the base of the barn in the drifts, head foremost. The top dressing of white powder that for weeks had adorned the woodpiles sifted down through the sticks in a wet scramble for the bottom. All around the farm the buntings had picked the snow off, making the fields look as if brown mats were spread all over the floor. But yesterday the south wind puckered up its lips and blew all over everything in sight, and the brown mats disappeared, or rather grew into one big one. The cows in the barnyard looked longingly over the fence toward the pasture, 
and the fowls take a longer walk than they have dared for months, away out in the garden, where loping brown vines and nude bush stalks bear witness to what they have suffered. The sun shines across the dooryard as it hasn't shone for so long, making a thin coat of mud just at the edge of the chips and around the doorsteps. But what matters? The children run in and out, tracking up the clean floors, taking their scolding with good cheer. Isn't spring here? And don't they hear the bluebird's note in the orchard? Run, run, and put up some more little boxes on the shed and the fence posts. Clean out the last year's nests in the hollow trees. Tell the old cat to keep mum and lie low, or she will be put in a bag and dropped to the bottom of the very first hole in the ice. Cats are all right in the dead of winter, when old Boreas is frantic in his annual mad fit. She can sit on the rug and purr to her heart's content. But when the bluebirds come, if she bethinks herself of the fact and sharpens her claws against the trunk of a cherry tree, she would better look out. When the old cat sharpens her claws, she means business, especially if she turns her head in the direction of the orchard. From the orchard comes a soft, agreeable, oft-repeated note. There is a quivering of wings outspread, and he is here. There may be only one or two or six singers. They have left the lady bluebirds in a safe place until they are sure of the weather. If the outlook be bad tomorrow, the birds will retire out of sight and wait for another warm spell. But spring is really here, and the good work of the sun goes on. In a day or two, the ladybirds appear modestly, of paler hue than the males, quiet but quick and glad of motion. It is the time of sweethearts. A blue beauty whose latest coat is none the worse for winter wear alights near the mate of his choice, sitting on a twig. He goes very near her and whispers in her ear. She listens. He caresses a drooping feather torn in her wing as she dodged the brush in the journey. She thinks it very kind of him to do so. Suddenly an early fly appears, traveling zigzag slowly somewhere, probably on some family business of its own. Bluebird spies it and makes for it, not on his own account. Oh, no. He snatches it leisurely and presents it to his love, still sitting on the tree. She thanks him and wipes her beak on a smaller twig. So little by little and by very winning ways does this gentle blue courtier pay his suit of Miss Bluebird. A chance acquaintance of Bluebird sidles up to the same branch on which the two have been sitting. Bluebird courtier likes him not. He will have no rival, and so he drives the intruder away as far as the next tree, returning to his suite and singing a low warble about something we do not understand. Probably he is giving her to understand that he will do the right thing by her all the time, never scolding, as indeed he never does, and looking to the family supplies, and in all things that pertain to faithful affection will prove himself worthy of her. She consents, taking his word for it, and they set about the business of the season. Now they must hurry or the wrens will come and drive them out of house and home. One of the bluebirds remains in the nesting place or very near it, for if the house be empty of inmates, the wrens make quick work of pulling out such straws and nesting material as have been gathered. If the people of the farm or other home be on the watch, they can lend a hand at this time. Offered inducements by way of many boxes or nesting places with handfuls of fine litter will attract the wrens, and the bluebirds will be untroubled. It may be that a cold snap will come up in a driving hurry after the nesting is well underway. In this event, the birds will disappear probably to the deep, warm woods or the shelter of hollow trees, until the storm be passed, when they will come again and take up the work where they left off. This sudden going and coming on account of the weather has always been a mystery to those who study the bluebirds. Some imagine they have a castle somewhere in the thickest of the woods where they hide, making meals on insects that love old, damp trees. Caves and rock chambers have been explored in search of the winter bluebirds, but not a bird was found in either place. They keep their own secrets, whether they fly far off to a warmer spot or whether they hide in cell or castle. If the work is not anticipated by human friends and the nesting place is cleaned out in advance of the birds, they will tidy up the boxes themselves, both birds working at it. What do they want of last year's litter with its invisible little mites and things that wait for a genial warmth to hatch out? House cleaning is a necessity with the bluebirds. When the nest is done, it is neat and compact composed of sticks and straws with a softer lining. The birds accept what is ready to hand, making no long search for material. Being neighbor to man and our habitations, it uses stable litter. The three to six pale blue eggs contrast but slightly with the mother's breast. 
the little ones grow in a hurry, for well it is known that more broods must be attended to before summer is over. Sometimes the nest is placed at the bottom of a box or passageway, and the young birds have difficulty in making their way to freedom. The old birds in such a case are said to pile sticks up to the door, and the little ones walk up and out as if on a ladder. The mother soon takes to preparing for another brood, and the father assumes all the care of the young just out, leading them a short distance from the mother and teaching them to hunt insects and berries. The little ones are not blue, as anyone may see, but brown with speckled breasts. These speckled breasts of young birds are fashionable costumes for many other than bluebirds. They remind one of infantile bibs to be discarded as soon as the young things eat and behave like their elders. When the persimmons are ripe in the late fall, whole families of bluebirds collect in the trees for the fruit. They love apples as well, but apples are hard and less in early spring after the frost has thawed out of them, so the birds take the persimmons first. It is at this time, when they are flitting from tree to tree, that any person who will take the trouble of hiding underneath and keeping still will catch glimpses of the yellow soles of the bluebird's feet. The legs are dark above the soles. There is a legend about this that is pleasing to know and halfway believed by lovers of legends. And one need not be ashamed of one's fondness for legends. Legends are as old as the hills, and folklore has preserved them. Now that the printer has become the guardian of such things, we expect a legend with every bird and beast, and a life history of either is hardly complete without. Nearly all the birds of North America are entitled to a legend through the nature-loving Indians, the first inhabitants of our country. They have left little data, but enough has been gleaned from their folklore to put us on the trail of many a delightful story. Some of our legends may be of recent date, but all have a fascination of their own. The ancients loved myth and weird, fanciful tales. We are descendants of the ancients, and we love the same things. Once upon a dreary time, a flood of water covered all the earth. The land birds were all huddled together in a little boat, twittering to each other of a bright tomorrow, as they do to this day. As the storm grew harder, the birds grew cold, not having any clothes up to that date. This was the first rain that ever came, and caught many things, of course, unprepared. The birds had been of naked skin like the lizards, but their beaks had grown, else how could they have been twittering to one another of a bright tomorrow? On this very morrow of song, the boat being far above the mountain tops, a single ray of sunshine appeared at a crack in the cabin house. The blue bird always, from the very first, being on the lookout for stray bits of sunshine, sprang to the spot, which was just big enough for his two feet. When the sun went back behind the clouds, it was found that the stray bit of it, which the bluebird had hopped upon, remained on the soles of his feet. That is the way the bluebird came by his yellow soles. And he came by his blue coat in this wise. When the storm had spent itself, the bluebird was the first to go out of the boat, straight toward heaven, singing as he went. When he got to the blue sky, he stopped not, but pushed his way straight through, rubbing the tint of the sky right onto his uncolored feathers that had grown in a flash when he left the boat. His mate followed straight through the hole her lord had made, but of course she did not get so much blue as he, the hole being rubbed quite dry of its paint. Ever since the first flight of the bluebird, somewhere the sun has shone through the rift he made in the sky, and he carries hope of spring in his wake. The bluebirds are good neighbors, never quarreling nor troubling other birds. In the late fall his note changes to a plaintive one, as if he were mourning for the dear, delightful days of summertime and nursery joys. It is now that he, with his large family, may be seen on weed stalks in the open country, looking for belated insects and searching for beetles and spiders among the stones. In darting for winged insects, the bluebird does not take a sudden flight, but sways leisurely as if he would not frighten his treasure by quick movements. Besides this particular bluebird, so well known all over North America, there are two other members of the family, differing only slightly in coloring and similar in habits. These are the western and arctic bluebirds. The bluebirds are the morning glories of our country. They are companions of the violet of spring and the asters in autumn. They belong to the blue sky and the country home and the city suburbs. When the English sparrow is weary of being made into pot pie and baby broth, it will go on its way to the North Pole or the Southern Ocean, and our darling in blue will have no enemy in all the land. When all the gay scenes of the summer are o'er, and autumn slowly enters so silent and sallow, and millions of warblers that charmed us before 
have fled in the train of the sun-seeking swallow, the bluebird, forsaken yet true to his home, still lingers and looks for a milder tomorrow, till forced by the horrors of winter to roam, he sings his adieu in a lone note of sorrow. Wilson End of chapter 10「Chapter Eleven of Birds of Song and Story. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Birds of Song and Story by Elizabeth and Joseph Grinnell. The Tanager People. Magic bird, but rarely seen phoenix in our forest green plumed with fire and quick as flame phoenix else thou hast no name it is a large tribe of numerous species in america but the scarlet tanager alone may well be termed the red man of the forest native of the new world shy a gypsy in his way harmless to agriculture a hunter by nature fascinating to all eyes that light on him it is as if nature had a surplus of red and black the day she painted him and was determined to dip her brush in nothing else this contrast of color has made him one of our most familiar birds but as with many another of striking hue the scarlet tanager has an indifferent song among our flowers like the scarlet geraniums and hibiscus we do not look for the fragrance that distinguishes the pale violet or wild rose it is as if the bright tint of bird or blossom is sufficient of itself and nature would not bestow all virtues upon one individual still the musical qualities of this tanager are not to be despised his few notes may be almost monotonous but they are pensive even tender when addressed to his dear companion for whom his little breast holds warm affection she too at nesting time utters the same pensive note and the two may be noticed in the treetops whispering to one another in low tones it is not for his song therefore that we seek the bird but hearing the song we would see the singer and who can blame us we love the deeper tints of sunset and sunrise the red and yellow of autumn leaves the red glow of the prairie fire the tint of the baldwin apple and the sops of wine a tree of dull green apples in the orchard though of finer flavor will be neglected more especially by the wandering boy for its crimson-cheeked neighbor of indifferent relish the red apples of the naked winter bough left on purpose for jack frost and the birds to bite are said to allure the latter before the paler fruit of the next tree is disturbed therefore when a nature lover wanders into the woods in dreamy mood and the scarlet tanager flits above him amid the green of the foliage the thrush and the sparrow are forgotten the tanager is discreet by nature for it is as if he knows that by glimpses only he is best appreciated were he less retiring as bold in habit as in color sitting on the roofs and fence posts swinging the nest pendant from boughs like the oriole he would be less fascinating but the tanager is seldom more than half seen he is detected for an instant like a flash and disappears it is with the eye as with the hand we would hold in the grasp of our fingers what we covet to touch or own and the eye would retain in its deep fortress if only for a moment the tint it feasts on more especially is this the case if the thing we would hold or see is transitory by nature 
So when we sit down on a half-decayed log bedecked with toadstools and hear the note of a scarlet tanager overhead, we listen and are moveless. It is repeated, and if we are unacquainted with the bird, we may think him to the right of us. Actually, he is on the left, being endowed with the gift of ventriloquism. By this gift or attainment, the beautiful creature eludes his human foes. For foes, the tanager surely has, the more's the pity. Not content to adore the bird as part and parcel of generous nature, there are those who would pay their homage to the wings only, set among feathers and plaited straw. Such lose the fine art of tenderness. The face that would pale at sight of a brown mouse shines with pride beneath a remnant of red plumage, literally dyed with the lifeblood of their original owner. Angelina has a hat with wings on every side. Slaughter of the innocence, those pretty wings supplied. Sign of barbarity, sign of vulgarity, that winged hat. Well, let Angelina's hat pass for what it is worth to her. It is no more than the redbirds have had to submit to all their life history. There isn't a savage tribe but has made use of bright feathers for dress, either in skins or quills. The dark-skinned native is dressed for church if he wear a single feather tucked in his scalp lock or a frail shoulder cape of crimson breasts stripped from the bird in the bush. It may be the tanager has a sort of dull instinct to hide himself on this account in the deep foliage, deeming it the better part of valor to keep out of harm's way when a nature lover sits on the toadstool bedecked log to watch for him. His mate of dull greenish-yellow has less enemies in the disguise of admirers, and her little heart has no call to flutter when the so-called nature lover haunts the woods. She goes on with her nest building on the arm of a maple or even lonely apple tree, making haste, for well she knows the season is short in which to raise their single brood. By the middle of August, they must be off, have the wings of the young grown sufficient strength, and yet the old birds only arrived from their warmer clime in the south when May was half over or later. Like the gross beaks, the tanager's nest is loosely built of twigs and stalks, transparent from below, as if ventilation were more necessary than softness. The dull blue eggs, spotted with brown or purple, may be distinctly seen from beneath when the sun is shining overhead. But why worry the mother bird by long gazing? She is in great distress. Were the ear of the nature lover properly tuned, he would understand her to be saying, They're mine, they're mine. I beg, I beg. Don't touch, don't take. But in due time, the young are juveniles, not nurslings, and they leave the nest. Too soon the worse for wear on account of its careless build. At first, the thin dress of the young is greenish-yellow like the mother, and they may pass unnoticed amid the late summer foliage. The male juveniles, during their first year, somewhere change to brighter hues in spots and dashes of red and black, as if their clothes had been patched with leftovers from their father's wardrobes. The fathers themselves, before they fly to the warm south, drop their scarlet feathers like tatters amid the ferns and blueberries, and girls pick them up for the adorning of doll hats. No merrier sight, and none more innocent of character, 
than this of little girls searching for what is left of the beautiful summer visitor picking up as it were the shreds of his memory these scarlet feathers together with those of the summer yellow bird placed in layers or helter-skelter in the case of gauze make a fairy pillow for winter times pretty to look at they come with thistle-down and milkweed tassels and sumac droppings and maple leaves and the first oozing of spruce gum in the woods yes and beechnuts and belated goldenrod and the first frosts that nip the cheek of the cranberry in the bog and the huckleberry patches littered with tiny plumes for tanagers love the huckleberries that leave no stain on their greenish yellow lips these huckleberries are their chief food in late berry time coming as they do when the juveniles need a change in their meat diet before the long flight ahead of them up to this date they made good square meals from fat beetles and other insects big enough to pay for catching that bumblebees and wasps are endowed with sharp points in their character does not forbid the use of them for tanager food though it is presumed that the stings are either squeezed out or the insect killed before it is fed to the nestlings as we have noticed in the case of the phoebes in these late summer days the singer punctuates his song often and long for he must recuperate for his autumn journey more than this he must protect his young ones he therefore loses the shyness of spring and follows the juveniles about feeding them and teaching them to shift for themselves and protecting them with word and sign his whole care is for his family and hard is a cruel world indeed whose human inhabitants can molest him his scarlet cloth is forgotten he will follow his young even into captivity and there feed them through bar or window but not a fascinating prisoner is the tanager one grows accustomed to his bright coat and as it is seen against the pane in winter time contrasting with the whiteness of the snow seems to reproach the hand that imprisoned it when one stops to think of it scarcely a bird in captivity unless it be the canary to the manner born gives the satisfaction and amusement anticipated it is the going and coming of the wild birds that make more than half the fun the sudden surprise of spring the reluctant departure of autumn with the hope of intermediate days there is charm in all this keeping of nature's order well good-bye sweet scarlet tanager sing us back your farewell note of wait wait we shall see you again when the early cherries are ripe if not sooner the beetles and bumbles and the grasshoppers will be watching out for you and the terrible hornet shall double his armor plate to suit the strength of your strong beak it will be of no avail for the big black beetle to hide beneath the iron kettle he carries on his back and the bum of the big yellow bumblebee will serve only as its call note while the broad sword of the hornet will have no time to unsheath itself at sight of you good-bye tanager End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of birds of song and story this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter Birds of Song and Story 
by Elizabeth and Joseph Grinnell. Chapter 12. The Meadow Lark. Hark, the lark! Shakespeare. Think every morning when the sun peeps through the dim, leaf-latticed window of the grove, how jubilant the happy birds renew their old, melodious madrigals of love. And when you think of this, remember too, tis always morning somewhere, and above the awakening continents from shore to shore, somewhere the birds are singing evermore. Longfellow. Never did any lark lean its breast against a thorn and sing. That was the poet's sorry fancy. Larks are not in the habit of leaning their breasts against anything when they sing. They stand tiptoe on a stout grass stem or a fence post or the highest bough or sing as they fly or warble a simple ditty while running on the ground. It is on account of this habit of his, always having his song at his tongue's end, that the poets have made the lark the subject of many a moral romance. His feet are on the earth while his song is in the sky. High or low, in joy and pain, warm or cold, wet or dry, sing like the lark. And he is given the credit of waking up the morning, and also of tucking in the night, and of blowing the noon whistle, and all sorts of intermediate duties. He doesn't deserve it all more than other birds, however. But it is the poet who sings as often as the mood takes him. If it be the lark that inspires him at this particular moment, the lark is his theme. Or if it be the raven, or the wren, or any other winged subject, it is one and the same to the poet. But country people are all poets. In their hearts they have enshrined the meadow lark, because he is very near them, and gives them little cause to despise him. He has no tooth for fruit or grain, unless he happens to stumble on it unawares. He never seems to seek it like the sparrows. Resident in many places, even when the snow is up to his knees, in the open field, in the margin of woods, where it is cool and grassy, in damp meadows where the insect people have their summer home, and if food be scarce, even in the barnyard litter may the meadow lark be seen. Yes, seen and heard. Very often he is heard and not seen, and no one need see him to know him. His song is his passport to everybody's heart. There's the meadow lark, exclaims a white-haired man, bent with much listening and many sorrows, leaning on memory and his strong cane for support and his eye brightens, as no youthful eye can shine, at sound of the familiar melody. Yes, he says, that is the meadow lark. He's somewhere down in the open. I knew him when I was a boy. And the old man, who is a boy again, walks weakly off to the nearest field, bent on flushing the comrade of his childhood. He sits feebly down on a log and rests, it is the same log he climbed when he was a boy. It was not horizontal as long ago as that, but perpendicular, and was green-topped and full of orioles' nests. It lies prone on the ground now, long ago cut straight in two at the base, and it has laid there so long it has grown black and mildewed. On account of this mildew, and the toadstools that have ruffled and fluted and bedecked its softened bark, the insect people have made their home in it. The old man sitting there, waiting for the meadow lark to appear, thinks not of the insect people, but of the lark. With the tip of his strong cane he breaks off a piece of the serried bark, and a spider scurries down the side of the log and into the grass. He chips off another piece, and a bevy of sow bugs make haste to tumble over and play dead, curling their legs under their sides, but recovering their senses and scurrying off after the spider. The cane continues to chip off the bark, and down tumble all sorts of wood people, some of them hiding like a flash in the first moist earth they come to, others never stopping until they are well under the log, where experience has taught them they will be safe out of harm's way. And they declare to themselves, and to each other, that they will never budge from under that log until it is midnight, 
and that wicked meadow lark is fast asleep. Of course, it is no other than the meadow lark the insect people are running away from. They never saw the old man, nor the tip of his cane that was doing all the mischief. They know their feathered foe of old. What care they for his song? He is always on their trail. So when the old man sat down heavily on the log, and the point of his cane jarred the loose bark, out tumbled the tenants, expecting each of them to be presented with a bill, but the bill of their dreaded enemy is a rod or two away. He has had his breakfast already. It was composed of all sorts of winged and creeping folk, including many an insect infant bundled all up in its swaddling clothes and not half conscious of its fate. It was for this very purpose that he was up so early. Of course, the poets did not take his breakfast into account when they wrote verses about his rising with the sun and singing with the first beam of day. Nothing in the world brought him out of bed save his ever-present appetite, and the farmers have cause to bless their stars that the meadow lark has an appetite of his own. Also, that he and his spouse make their nest in the grass, and that the baby larks get about on the ground long before they are able to fly fence high. But are we leaving the old man sitting too long on that damp log? He may catch a cold. Of one thing we are certain, he will catch sight of that rogue lark if he waits half an hour. He used to wait just that way when he was a boy, though to keep still half as long in any other place for any other purpose would have been a physical impossibility. His specks are on the end of his nose now, for the old man has good far sight, and he squints knowingly at a bunch of meadow grass three rods away. Who says the eye of the aged grows dim? The eye of this particular old man never shone brighter even when he climbed that identical elm and came near losing his balance, reaching after the orchard oriole's nest that swung empty, just at tantalising distance. What did the boy want of that nest? He just wanted to get it, that was all. And what does the old man want of the meadow lark carolling at the base of bunch grass somewhere ahead of him? Why, he just wants his nest, that is all. Suddenly, up pops the bird, right out of the waving mound he was sure to be in, and he flies low to the nearest stone heap, looking the old man right in the eyes, as if he had as easy a conscience as ever reposed in the breast of man or bird. And no other conscience has the meadow lark, to be sure. It is the same conscience that has descended to him through his ancient family, down through countless generations. But the old man isn't after the conscience of the dear bird. He is after what may develop at the base of that grassy mound. Over toward it he goes, feeling with his cane, poking the buttercups and smartweed and yarrow aside. Ha! he laughs. I've got it, Mary! Mary isn't anywhere in sight but the old man's habit of telling Mary everything stands by him like any good friend. He has been telling her everything all his life, and why shouldn't he tell her about this lark's nest, the very latest discovery of his? No deceiving this old boy. All those meadow grasses, bent low and forming a rather awkward archway over a possible corridor, hold secrets. Out darts the mother lark with many a sign of maternal anxiety. And the singer discontinues his morning carol. The old man kneels very stiffly down in the meadow. He thinks he is dropping down with a jerk in boy fashion. And parts the grasses. He peers in and sees something. He laughs, parting his gums wide, exhibiting to a black and yellow bumblebee a solitary tooth like the last remaining picket on the garden gate he swung on when he was a boy. Then he rises stiffly and goes as fast as his legs can carry him, exactly as he has always done for seventy-five years, more or less, straight to tell Mary. Just as he reaches the doorstep and places his strong cane against the corner, preparatory to lifting his right foot, 
he turns to take a look at the spot he has just left, empty-handed, in the meadow. He shades his eye from the nine o'clock sun, and sees a crouching form no bigger than was his own at the age of ten. He tries to shout, but that one tooth standing in the door of his lips like a faithful sentinel, or something back of and behind it in the years that are gone, prevents his voice from reaching farther than the stone wall at the garden's edge. Mary, inside, darning hand-knit stockings, hears the voice that is dear to her, lo, these many years, and she does the shouting. Somehow her voice is the stronger of the two. Get out of that meadow, boy! No stealing lark's eggs in here! The boy slinks back down to the road fence and bethinks him of another meadow, out of sight of folks, where no end of larks are singing. When the nesting season is over, and maybe there were a couple of broods, the larks will club together on a picnic excursion and wander off and on, nobody knows just where. Perchance they will turn up in the next town, or the next county, or the next state. As they wander, they will sing plaintively, stopping for meals where meals are served. Or they will chatter all together, recognise wherever their happy lot is cast, loved by the loving, perhaps eaten by the sensual. It will be remembered that the lark was a wedding guest of no ordinary office at the marriage of Cock Robin and Jenny Wren. At the very last feature of the beautiful ceremony, the ballad runs this wise. Then on her finger fair Cock Robin put the ring, while the lark aloud did sing, Happy be the bridegroom, and happy be the bride, and may not man nor bird nor beast this happy pair divide. After the cruel blunder was done, which was the fault of neither bird nor beast nor man, by intention, and the question as to who should act the part of Clark at the last sad burial rites was raised, it was the lark who volunteered, though it is to be supposed that his heart was breaking. Who will be the clerk? I, said the lark, if it's not in the dark, and I will be the clerk. Now, why the lark should object to doing this very solemn service for his dead friend the robin, if it should happen to be dark, we cannot tell. Perchance he really couldn't act the part of a clerk at night, on account of his family having been forbidden, centuries and centuries ago, to lean any more against the moon in the first quarter. It used to be a habit of theirs to sing that way, and that is how they came by the crescent on their breast. The gods made up their minds that if all the larks in the world took to leaning their breasts against the moon all at one time, it would result in toppling the old moon over. The meadow lark being the last of the family of larks to obey the command, flew away with the shadow of the crescent under his throat. Anybody can see it for himself in plain sight. So, as intimated, the lark at the funeral, remembering that he couldn't have a moon to lean against, refused to do the part asked of him if the ceremony occurred after dark. Though, come to think of it, this legend about the crescent must be a very recent date, for the lark of the ballad could have been no other than the English skylark, which has no crescent. But the moon has a crescent, and so has our meadow lark, and so, if there be a grain of truth in the ballad and the legend, our dear singer must have been spirited across the sea for that special occasion. Our interest in this old ballad of Cock Robin would have died before it began, had we not been informed of the whole affair with such precision as to details. For the benefit of those who doubt the event having ever occurred within the memory of man and birds, we will refer our readers to the inscription on a certain very old tombstone in Aldermary Churchyard, England. If they do not find a single reference to Cock Robin and the Lark which acted the part of Clark at the funeral, it will be because they have left their specks at home. Is it not a well-known fact that tombstones tell no falsehoods? Thinking all these things very calmly over, it occurs to us that, after all, 
any other of the singing birds we have mentioned in this book might be as well fitted to act the part allotted to the lark as that bird himself. The plain everyday facts are, it was a poet who reported the affair, and he was at his wit's end to find a word to rhyme with clerk, and a clerk he must have at a funeral of that date. Now the English tongue, wherever it is spoken, is a curious language. It seems ready-made to suit any figure, stout or slim, big or little. The poet knew that any person of good sense, accustomed to rhyming, would read the word clerk to sound like dark, hence the immortal rhyme. I, said the lark, if it be not in the dark, and I will be clerk. End of chapter 12「Thirteen of Birds of Song and Story. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. Birds of Song and Story by Elizabeth and Joseph Grinnell. Chapter 13. Skylark. Horned Lark. Under the greenwood tree who loves to lie with me and tune his merry note unto the sweet bird's throat, come hither, come hither, come hither. Here shall he see no enemy but winter and rough weather. In Shakespeare's play, As You Like It, scene five, Amiens, a close student of nature, is made to sing this song. It probably caused his companion, Jaquez, to remember the skylark of his own boyhood, for he besought Amiens to sing it again. But Amiens argued with his friend that it would make him melancholy. However, he sang again, and it is supposed that the two lived over the days of their boyhood, when they lay on the grass under the greenwood tree, just on the edge of a cornfield, and listened to the skylark tuning his merry note in his own sweet throat. Dear to the heart of English boys and other people is the skylark, on account of which, and for the reason that Britishers of any age may like to meet an old friend, should they chance to take up this book in their travels, we are giving a chapter to this bird. In the play, Jacques and Amiens sing later together of all about their favourite lark, it is presumed, who loves to lie the sun seeking the food he eats, and pleased with what he gets. Surely the skylark loves to live in the sun, for he is always in the open, summer and winter, as if he would be sure to not miss a single sunbeam. As is the case with most of our birds who dwell or nest near our homes, the skylark does not seek man for his own sweet sake, but for the sake of what the farm holds. Though no marauder is this lark, for it eats ground insects nearly the whole year, crickets and beetles and grubs and worms, and little folk who see no further than their noses. To be sure, in late fall, after the farmer's buckwheat and other grains have ripened and mostly harvested, the larks visit the fields in flocks to gather up the crumbs and grow fat on the change from a meat to a vegetable diet. This growing fat, by reason of his generous diet in late fall, just before the snows come, serves the same purpose as does the fattening of bear just before winter. The snow covers larks, meat victuals all up, and the birds must fall back at times on their stores laid by under their skin for this very reason. Though they do not hibernate, they still have use for their fat. So has the gunner and the people with snares ready to set for the unwary and hungry birds. A recent writer, commenting on this autumn sport of the Englishmen, excuses their seemingly wanton destruction by observing that, were they not thus taken, large numbers would doubtless meet natural death in their autumn flights. To quote Shakespeare again, oftentimes excusing of a fault doth make the fault the worse. There seems to be a sort of inconsistency in the fact that, from earliest times, the human family have been guilty of eating what most they love, or what most they do declare they love. 
the flavour of the flesh of a bobolink or skylark is hardly out of the mouth before the tongue takes to praising the favourite bird with a psalm or hymn. In due time the poet and singer bethinks him of his annual feast of flesh, and his spiritual appreciation grows thin. We are thankful, in spite of all this, that the poets and singers sing on. They have immortalised the skylark of Europe, as no other known bird is immortalised. Superstition claims the bird as peculiarly its own. Do not its prophets divine things mysterious and darkly subtle by the skyward flight of the bird? And its song! Any priest of the craft may read into its varying notes all sorts of fortunes to people and clans. And the eggs of the skylark! Were they not speckled and streaked by passing night winds in the shape of fairies with garden gourds filled with the ink juice of the deadly nightshade berries? Were the skylark's eggs white, they would be moonstruck, and the hatchlings would sing the song of the night owl. In spite of the speckled eggs and the usual grassy cover of the nest, these are too often the successful object of the prowling boy, though it must be confessed that in this, as in the case of the robbery of other birds, it is not always the original finder of the nest who is guilty of theft. Shakespeare was aware of this fact, for, in Much Ado About Nothing, he makes Benedict speak of the flat transgression of a schoolboy, who, being overjoyed with finding a bird's nest, shows it his companion, and he steals it. The mistake was in showing it his companion, though, should the companion happen to be a girl, he need have no fear, the nest will be undisturbed next time he visits the spot. For eight months of the English year does the skylark sing, prodding the lazy, comforting the sorrowful, accusing the guilty, making more merry the glad. On account of its ever-circling upward flight, the bird is believed to hold converse with heaven. In captivity it is supposed to be longing for the sky when it flings itself against the roof of its cage. To protect it against harm in this last, Soft cloth is sometimes used for the cover to its home. In winter, when the skylarks cover the sandy plains of Great Britain, they have but a single cry, having laid by their songs with which to wake the spring, or it may be with them as in the case of our bobolinks. After a diet of ripe grains, they are too full for utterance. But when spring is actually astir, then are the larks abroad in the sky. Francis Rabelais, as long ago as the 14th century, loved the English spring for the sake of the skylark and the thoughts the bird inspired in him. Having no appetite, apparently, for the bird when he is fattened for eating, the poet longed for larks in the act of singing, as if, could he hold one of them in his hand when it was articulating, he might come by its written song as the telegrapher reads the scroll as it unwinds. But he wouldn't be content with one bird. Oh, no! If ever the sky should fall, he made up his mind to catch larks by the basketfuls. But the heavens never were known to fall in lark singing time, and the poet is long since under the sod with the skylarks nesting above him. To be like a singing bird has been the longing of human hearts in all ages, as if we realise that there is medicine in song as in nothing else medicine to the singer, and so there is. No higher compliment could be paid by a poet to the memory of his friend than the following, dated in the 17th century. There is a happy lesson of work and good nature and lightness of heart in a trying occupation, too good to lose. There was a jolly miller once, lived on the River Dee. He worked and sung from morn to night, no lark more blithe than he. Several attempts to introduce the English skylark into America have been made, with no satisfactory results. It is hoped to some day have them feel at home on the Pacific coast, where the varying moist and dry climates of north and south would give them the pleasures of their natural migrations. But although we may never have the skylark with us, we have its relative in our horned or shore larks, 
In its habits, it resembles its lark kindred in the old world, singing on the wing, nesting on the ground, feeding on the same food, walking rapidly, reserving flight as the last resort when pursued. The horned lark is so named on account of a little tuft of feathers on each side of the forehead, which it raises or lowers at pleasure. It nests in the north very early, even before the snow is all melted, and brings off two or more broods in a season. In the autumn it exchanges its beautiful song for a good appetite, and fattens itself on grains and berries in anticipation of possible winter hunger. It may be seen all over North America at some season of the year, in fall and winter in flocks. In California we have the Mexican horned larks, which cover the mesas and rise reluctantly in large numbers when surprised. They love to follow the open country roads, running out of the track while we pass, but returning as soon as we have gone our way. On rainy days, which, by the way, are the best of bird days, we have taken our umbrellas and strolled out to the flatlands on purpose to see these larks in their greatest numbers. They will fly with a whir of sound and alight almost at our feet to repeat the act for a mile if we choose. In midsummer they are seen in the vicinity of their nesting places, standing in rows under fences or plants with mouths wide open, seeming to choose hot sand to flying straight across the short desert to mountain retreats. The horned larks, wherever seen, suggest contentment and pleasure in life as they find it. End of chapter 13「Chapter 14 of Birds of Song and Story. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Kathleen Danielson. Birds of Song and Story by Elizabeth and Joseph Grinnell. Bobolink. June, dear June, now God be praised for June. Nuff said. June's bridesman, poet of the year, gladness on wings, the bobolink is here. Half hid in tip-top apple blooms he sings, he climbs against the breeze with quivering wings. Or, given way to it in a mock despair, runs down a brook of laughter through the air. Lowell. He was just a bird to start with, half blackbird and the other half sparrow, with some of the meadowlark's ways of getting along. As to the naming of him, everybody settled that matter at random, until one day he grew tired of being called nicknames and named himself. Think of having Skunk Blackbird called after a fellow when he deserved the title no more than half a dozen of his feathered friends. He could never imagine what gave him the disagreeable epithet, unless it be his own individual hatred for the animal whose name clung to him like mud. To be sure, the coat of the bird was striped, something like that of the detestable beastie, but so were the coats of many other birds, and he could never tell why he should be called a blackbird either. True, he loved the marshes for personal reasons, but who has seen a blackbird twist its toes around a reed stalk and sing like mad? So, as we said, he named himself, constituting himself a town crier on behalf of his own concerns. Bobolink, Bobolink! As often as the blackbird attempted to talk of himself, Bobolink chimed in and drowned every other note. And he kept it up for two or three months until everybody understood that he had given himself a proper name. And each year he returns to remind the skunk and blackbird that he is no other than himself, and to assure people that he is deserving of an original name, whatever else may be said of him. But the skunk never has quite forgiven the bobolink his resentment of the name, for the ugly little creature haunts the bird in marsh and meadow, watching for the young bobolinks to get big enough for eating, exactly as the bobolink waits for the dandelion seeds to get ripe for his dinner. But dandelion seeds and little baby bobolinks are two different sorts of victuals, and Father Bobolink, swaying on his weed stem, wishes skunks were not so big so he could turn on the whole family and devour them as he does the bumblebees in the next stone heap. It is of no use wishing, for the old feud between the hated animal and the coveted bird is still on. 
and Skunk knows very well how to get the best of the bobolink. Bobolinks see better by daytime, and besides, they are tired out with singing all day long, and they sleep like Christians all night. It is then, when the moon is little, and the flowers have closed their eyes, and the grass stems are growing silently in the dew, and the cicada is absorbed in the courting of his sweetheart, ah, it is then that Skunk walks abroad, sniffing. Tails straight out behind, gently swaying as he goes, nose well pointed toward the nearest grass tufts, thoughts intent on supper, and alas, baby bobolinks quietly sleeping. Skunk may take in the mother as well while she broods, she, no doubt, having a violent attack of nightmare, could she but live to tell her mate about it. Yes, indeed, poor bobolink has his trials, and he is entitled to all the sweet melody of his family to help him rise above them. When he is tired of New England polecats and takes a run down south, it is but to meet his other enemy, the opossum. And he might as well be given the name of opossum bird, for, like the skunk, the opossum loves the still dark night and fat old bobolinks. Should the bobolink and his juvenile family take to a tree for a roosting place, provided his supper has not made his body heavier than his wings are strong, opossum will climb after him. So poor Bobolink is pursued on every hand. Bird of the ground is he everywhere. He is born on the ground and dies on the ground, usually, for the ground is his dinner table. His human friends, or foes, take him pitilessly at his meals when he is too full for utterance or quick flight. And these human friends, or foes, dine upon him until they in turn are too full for utterance. Oh, the Bobolink has a hard time. But still he named himself out of the glee of his heart, and he sings a fourth part of the year as only a bobolink can sing. You can make almost anything you please of the song. Children sit on the fence rails and mimic him, and guess what he says, and cry, Spink, spank, spink, meadow wink, meadow wink, just think, just think, don't you wink, don't you wink, want a drink, want a drink? Coming back to his real name, bobolink, bobolink as if, after all, that were the nearest right. Right under the swinging bare feet of the children, in a dark, cool nest, Mother Skunk is fast asleep, making up for last night's carousals among the bobolink nests. June would be no June without the bobolinks, where they are expected, and so ever so many things get ready for them. For what other purpose than for the bobolinks do the ground beetles air themselves, and the crickets get out their violins, and the gray spiders spin yarn on their doorsteps? Of course, it is all for purposes of their own, since nobody knows that beetles and crickets and spiders particularly love to be gobbled up by a bobolink. But it is one and the same to the bobolink family, who must have food of some sort, and they couldn't at this season of the year, and under the peculiar conditions of family life, get along reasonably well without meat of some sort. Later on, when the dandelions bethink themselves to turn into round white moons that fly away in the breeze, and the wild oats lift their shoulder capes, the bobolinks can turn vegetarians. Shy, suspecting little birds, sharp of eye, fresh from a winter tour in the West Indies, they come exactly when they are expected. They never disappoint people. The very earliest to arrive may sing their Don't You Wink, Don't You Wink on April 1st. But a bobolink makes no April fool of himself or anybody else, unless it be Master Skunk in his hollow tree, who rubs his eyes at the first word from robber to Lincoln. But the male birds have come in advance of their women folk and roost high and dry out of reach of four-footed marauders. It is as if the mother bobolinks would be quite sure the spring storms are over before they put themselves in the way of housework. Until their mates arrive, the male birds go on a lark, sailing low over meadows, singing as they sail, each outdoing his friend, sitting now on a fence post and now on the budding branch of a maple or elm, calling their own names and adding whole sentences or stanzas in praise of the Middle West country, and of New England in particular. Then comes the fun of courtship, when the modest lady bobolinks appear on the ground. With the praise of them on their lips, the males come near and ask each for the hand of his lady love. Should a rival seek an accepted sweetheart, the rightful mate drives him from the field, literally speaking, and the by no means dejected lover goes to another meadow for a bride. And that is all right, for aren't all lady bobolinks alike? No, indeed they are not, or so think their devoted mates, 
for never was closer tie than binds the two to one another. The male never leaves the neighborhood of his family, but sings to his mate as she attends fondly to those affairs which gladden the heart of nature among bird or beast or insect. And she has not far to go for nesting materials. She may even shorten matters by shoving together a bunch of dry leaves and grass that served for the nest of a field mouse last fall. And she eats as she works, for at every pull at blade or leaf an insect runs out of its hiding place right into her mouth, as it were. And if the farmer happen to be plowing, she will run along at the back of him on the margin of the last furrow for grub or larva, slipping back into the grass of the hayfield before ever he turns for the next furrow. If the bobolinks flew north in the light of the moon, they may expect good luck. And sometime in June, where before there were a pair of birds, there are now half a dozen, or one more than that. The eggs are five or six, but, as with most birds, there's no telling. And if the parents succeed in raising three or four children out of their single brood for the summer, they do well. There's no better June fun than hunting for bobolinks' nests. When it comes to disturbing them, that is another question. The farmer may not like to have his meadow grass trodden down before it is piled on the hay wagon, but it can't be helped. And while the search is going on, there are so many other things coming to pass at the same time, quite unlooked for, that one sometimes laughs and sometimes cries. There are the bumblebees, for instance. The boys hadn't taken them into account, and a fellow shins begin to warn him of danger that is mostly past. And there are the nettles hiding in their own nooks on purpose to sting and the little patches of smart weed which one has to cross in going from the east end of the meadow to the west end harbors crawling and hopping people that one doesn't see in time to avoid. And though they don't bite at all, they do look and feel... Well, most any boy knows how they feel if he cannot tell it. Oh yes, it is fun hunting bobolinks' nests if one respects the rights of one's neighbors and feathers. With notebook and pencil, a boy can put down the date of hatch and growth of quill and beak and strength and a thousand things it is good to know about birds. Only, as a rule, a single boy never goes on a bobolink hunt, and it's of no use for a whole bevy of boys to load themselves with lead pencils. They never have been known to put down a single item of observation under those circumstances. To make a business of studying bobolinks or other birds, a person must be all alone. And there isn't the temptation to pilfer when one is all alone, one catches sight of the father bobolink swinging and swaying on a stout but yielding weed stalk, singing for all he is worth, and one cannot steal, not that time. But a nest would seldom be found if the foolish birds would keep a close mouth about the matter. It does seem as if they would learn after a while, but they don't. As soon as a stranger with two legs or four comes within sight of the spot, the birds set up what they intend for a warning cry, but which is in reality an information call. Under its spell, one can walk straight to the nest, which, even yet, on account of its color and surroundings, may be taken for an innocent bunch of grass, provided one has as good eyes as the skunk has nose. But nesting time passes with all its pleasures and trials and dangers and happy-go-lucky affairs. Late summer sees the young bobolinks out of the nest and away to the weed stalks with their parents. The young males set up an independent, though weakly melodious warble on their own account, though they have not yet forgotten their baby ways, and still coax the parents for a good bite of bug or beetle. It is about the only very young bird we are acquainted with that is as precocious in regard to song. It is by this only that it is recognized as a male in the first season, being clothed like the mother and sisters. And strange to say, about this time the father bobolink begins to don another dress, his black and white are inconspicuous, as if faded with the summer sun, and he ceases to sing as formerly. The fact is, he has no time to sing now, with the young birds to help along, as it is getting almost time to move. And this strange bird actually seems to forget which are his own children, for the whole neighborhood gathers together, males, females, and young, helter-skelter, each intent on gastronomic affairs and the growing of feathers. As the days wear away, and the sear and yellow leaf of sumac and beech and maple warn all good folk that winter is getting ready to travel back home, the bobolinks preen up. Slyly, like the Arab, they steal away. Not suddenly, as they came in the spring, but slowly and deliberately. The wings of the young must have time to expand, and season, and endure fatigue. 
Besides, bird families are not able to carry lunch baskets on an autumn outing. So the bobolinks pass slowly toward the south, feeding as they go, never exercising enough to lose weight, but actually fattening on the journey. Now, taking all things into account, the bobolinks are the most sensible of people. Persons who ought to know better by experience and observation hurry on a journey, take no time to enjoy the scenery and the people that live along the route. At the journey's end, they are depleted, tired, worn to skin and bone, and out of sorts with travel. Not so the bobolinks. They have no bones at the journey's end. They have fattened themselves into butter. They have put on flesh as the bare spring trees put on leaves, and the butternut takes in oil. All the way they eat and drink and make as merry as they can with so much fat on them. The yesterday's bird of mad music is today the bird of mad appetite. True, they may call out chink in passing, but chink means chock full, and people who delight in bobolink table fare recognize the true meaning of the note. Bobolink has forgotten to call his own name, so he answers to any nickname the Epicurean lovers of him please to call him by. Rice bird, reed bird, butter bird, anything or everything that is appropriate. And Possum sits up on a stump and laughs. Never mind, Possum, it's your turn all the time. If Bobolink could imitate you in the art of making believe dead, he would fare better, until folks found him out. People have little use for a dead Bobolink, unless shotgun or snare be in at the death. But Bobolinks never seem to learn of Possums, or anybody else. They follow in the wake of their ancestor Bobolinks, over the selfsame route to the south, dining in the selfsame rice fields, swinging on the selfsame reed stalks exactly as the reed stalks come up each year in the place of last season's petiole. It's a sad, pathetic tale. But wait! Spring is coming in the steps of last year's springtime, over the selfsame route to the selfsame end and fortunes. With the spring will return the bobolinks, as many have survived disaster. Before you know it, he will be calling himself in the meadows exactly as he called last spring, the seasons and the birds are but echoes of themselves. Robert o Lincoln, with his latest striped coat, will sway on the stems and wait for his sweetheart. He will flirt with neither sparrow nor thrush until she arrives. He is true as the bobolink. So is the polecat, growing lean under his winter stump and licking his lips at the sound of the farmer calling to his children, the skunk blackbird has come. When you can pipe in that merry old strain, Robert O. Lincoln, come back again. End of section, chapter 14. Chapter 15 of Birds of Song and Story. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros Birds of Song and Story by Elizabeth and Joseph Grinnell Chapter 15 At Nesting Time I pray you hear my song of a nest, for it is not long. In the preceding chapters we have said little about the female or mother birds. In referring to a single individual, we have used the pronoun he, as if he and no other were worthy of affectionate notice. As apology, we refer our readers to the title of our book, Birds of Song and Story. As it is mostly the male who sings, and also the male who wears the most beautiful plumage, we have given him the first or greater space it is the male who figures in myth or legend, since it is he who speaks, or is known for conspicuous markings. But always at the right season is the wife bird or the mother bird loyal and true, sweet and modest of color and habit. It is she who lives for a purpose, if purpose ever moves the heart of a bird. It is she who sacrifices her own individual preferences and joys for the sake of others. It is she, mostly, who makes the family fortunes. It is she, save in a few instances, who builds the nest and warms the eggs when once she has placed them where they ought to be. 
as it is the vocation or pleasure of her mate to sing it is hers to listen and surely her family cares would be dreary enough were it not for the song she hears it is always for her that her lord makes music as if he knows her mother term is long and monotonous many a time his eye is on her when the keenest human spy fails to see where that nest is no hiding the exact spot from old father bird didn't he help select it wasn't he there at the start of course he was in early spring before actual nesting time a male bird is seen coaxing his mate to think of the conveniences of some certain spot he flies to a corner or a crotch and turns and twists and makes signs and grows excited as if urging his mate to commence at that very moment and at that very spot wife bird coming to his side considers and accepts his suggestions or laughs at them as the case may be should she accept the sight of his choice it is not then not just at that moment it is as if she fears the noise and bustle of her companion may have attracted attention she returns in some quiet hour and all by herself begins her summer work we have seen a boisterous oriole lead his lady to a banana leaf and do his best to coax her into immediate acceptance of the location it is not until the following day that we notice the first swinging threads and it is the same with many other birds which nest near the house perhaps the linnet or house finch is the most persistent in choosing a nest site he is sometimes seen at the business late in the fall and early winter, turning about in corners and nest boxes, chattering to his mate, and making himself so silly. His mate, of more sense, looks on and lets him talk, seeming to smile at his foolishness. Doesn't he know at his age that she will be on hand at the proper time? As a rule, it is the mother bird who does all the nest work. We have seen her closely followed by the male, in the case of the linnet and many of the other finches. The song sparrow and chippy and towhee and mocker and oriole each keeps at the side of his dear companion and follows her on the wing, singing, while her mouth is full of grass or other stuff. When she alights at the threshold of her nursery, he alights too, on a near twig, to follow her back to the material in a moment or two. By hiding in the shrubbery, one can see so much of interest at nesting time. But, first of all, would bird lovers induce parent birds to choose the home grounds, preparation must be made some time in advance trees must be planted and allowed to grow naturally not in clipped or distorted forms birds love natural growth they recognize wild things and nooks when these are planned and made to grow in private grounds now and then a tree root upturned a pile of boughs a heap of cuttings and prunings the gardener would have condemned to the fire a bit of space overlooked by the lawn-mower moist and grass tangled wood-piles and logs left where they are until moss and toadstools have covered them and bugs have housed in them a thousand things people in their love of order and neatness dispose of at sight would prove untold attraction to the birds too many homes in city and country are not frequented by these visitors who really prefer our grounds to the woods when once they learn their welcome when induced for a single season to build in cultivated places a pair of birds will return often bringing several other pairs with them it seems as if certain birds are popular among their people and set the pace as it were in the matter of nesting habits the places they frequent are sought after by the rest and not only by their own kind or species but by birds of different character 
it is with birds as with humankind many different sorts make up a popular neighborhood bird families do not choose to wander away to some remote part of the country and make a settlement indeed as we have studied them birds delight in fraternal good fellowship within an area of two hundred feet square in our grounds we have counted thirty-three varieties in this single season of these fifteen have nested the linnet two varieties of goldfinch chipping sparrow song sparrow hummingbird towhee mocker peewee phoebe oriole thrush black-headed grosbeak yellow warbler and bush tit some of these have nested twice or three times in our long season these birds are not seen to quarrel nor to disagree as to the locations chosen each respects the other's rights even to keeping guard over one another's children be a single family or even one little bird in trouble each and all of these birds mentioned come to the rescue at such times the varying notes are a sound both interesting and amusing food and water are always before these birds in shady places or in the sunshine materials for nest building are spread before them the whole six months of the nesting season from horsehair and strings to mud paper rags bark feathers cotton dry grasses lint and a general assortment of lichens the linnets goldfinches hummers orioles yellow warblers and bush tits lose their wits over the fluffy white cotton our song sparrows and phoebes are not seen to use other than material of dark color like brown rootlets and mud for phoebes and old grass blades and dark horsehair for the sparrows mention has been made as to most of the others the linnets are the easier suited a black last year's sparrow's nest put in the box under the eaves in place of a new white cotton one is accepted with no questions asked we have substituted nest for nest many times and find there is no choice also we have substituted young birds of the same species and each and all are adopted sometimes we find an orphan birdling which is sure to be cared for provided it be placed in the nest of any kind motherly bird of course in thus trading or causing to be adopted young birds we are careful not to give a seed eater to a meat eater and vice versa an insect fair would hardly agree with nurslings accustomed to regurgitated food like the finches and hummers once we rescued a tiny young hummer from a wicked boy who had come to the treasure by theft the little thing was nearly dead with cold and hunger but we knew exactly where to find a dear motherly old soul in the person of a hummingbird who had just completed her nest we placed the orphan in the frail cradle so weak it could scarcely open its beak the old bird came at once cuddled and coddled the baby as only a hummingbird can do with her small soft breast in ten minutes the wee one was having its supper and it was raised by the foster parent there seems to be something in the breasts of mother birds at the nesting season akin to human instinct all these interesting studies go on with us at our door no cats are allowed within certain bounds and any home may be the same if the dwellers will take the trouble an ideal corner in a schoolyard would be one in which birds were taught confidence and dependence birds are subject to cultivation and encouragement if one is just making a start toward this quick movement in the shrubbery should not be indulged in loud sudden noises and throwing balls or other things at the commencing of the nest season frighten the birds one must learn to stand stock still and listen and look birds notice movement more than sound sidewise motions disturb where straight go-ahead methods are not noticed 
by gradually accustoming birds to one's presence and then to one's voice and then to the near approach one may succeed in taming wild birds at nesting time we have had the finches and linnets and towhees and bush tits and hummingbirds perfectly trustful even to some of the males whose presence at the nest is not absolutely essential we have had the parent birds feed the young from our hands we standing at the nest as to nesting itself the fun to be had of a spring morning is beyond description after learning this familiarity the birds will go on without noticing us the towhee straggles across the grass tugging a long rag much too heavy to fly with the mocker pulls straws from the torn end of a garden cushion the bush tit gathers bits of lichen from the bough on which our hands rest the phoebe scarcely waits for us to step aside that she may bite the shreds from the jute doormat to mix with her mud the sparrow scratching away under the tree for a bug and a bit of leaf at one and the same time treads on our toes in her fearlessness the hummer fans our faces with her wings should we happen to be near the cotton counter when the young birds are just big enough to tumble out of the nest then nursery times fairly begin the ground is alive with them of many sizes and features more especially as to beak they peep and scream and coax by sundown those not old enough to hop or flutter to a safe place are the source of great anxiety we are obliged to go out and help put the babies to bed and these twilight times more than the whole day are the cat times pussy understands the turmoil she skulks and prowls and scarcely dares to breathe in her silent hopes it is then that we dare breathe and many other things this incessant war on the feline tribe must be kept up would any one have birds around his home there is one thing at nesting time that puzzles us why do mother birds pass carelessly by so much good material they pick up this grass or string or feather to drop it for another and then why do they pass by this or that fly or other insect and pick up another they probably have their reasons the same as they choose between equally good nest locations it is on this account that we are particular to have a variety of everything in their way it is at nesting time that we take especial care of the garden table we furnish everything we imagine acceptable as soon as the young of finches or sparrows are out of the nest they are brought to the table by their parents all the birds have a sweet tooth they like cookies and pie and sugar and as will be remembered in the case of the sparrows good molasses it was when the tourist robins were here that we thought about the molasses the robins wouldn't take it clear as the sparrows did so we mixed it with meal they came and looked at it and tasted and liked it very well thinking to score a point for the temperance people we mixed some old bourbon with the pudding a tipsy robin would be a funny sight but not a morsel of the meal would they ever touch we kept up the game several days, it resulting at last in all the robins leaving the grounds in disgust. Then we tried it on the sparrows, but to no purpose. Every bird grew suspicious, and we had to give it up. This proved to us that birds cultivate the sense of smell. Birds in general are like the donkey, before whose nose is suspended a wisp of hay, tied to the end of a pole, to make him go. Of course, in the case of the donkey, the pole goes in advance of the nose, and it's a long while before the wisp and the appetite have a passing acquaintance. With the birds at our home, the wisp is always out, so they are in no hurry to migrate. They do not leave us for so much as a short visit to their folks in Mexico until the molt is well under way. Some summer visitants even molt completely with us, and it is a sorry season. 
by the time a young bird is able to hustle for himself he wouldn't know his own mother she has shed the feathers around the beak leaving her nose or mouth so grotesque one has to laugh seeming to understand the joke is at their expense some of our birds at this time keep well hidden and come only to the edges of the shrubbery for food or if overtaken in the open they run as fast as their legs can carry them a song sparrow without a bit of tail is hopping now under the window chirping her happy note but hiding if we look at her a hummer which yesterday took honey from the flowers we held in our lips sits on a tiny twig the picture of despair because her neck feathers are so thin a mocker who has drank all summer from the dish with the bees peeps at her shadow and preens imaginary quills half of them are on the ground by the table a phoebe sits alone on the housetop wailing thinking no doubt she is singing and looking the picture of distress with one tail feather and not enough of her ordinary neckerchief around her neck to cover the bare skin of it and the nests where are they just where they were but they are faded and old and deserted never does a young bird go back to the nest after it has once left it though some people believe they use it for a bed until long into the autumn we have not seen them do so they scorn the old thing isn't it as full of mites as it can hold of course it is especially if it be a linnet's nest when the third brood came out in the same nest we found it so infested with mites almost invisible that we could not touch it and the poor little birdlings had to bide their time in getting away it is supposed to be on account of these parasites that some birds compose their nests of strong smelling weeds however we have not known any of the nests near us to be disturbed by these parasites save those in which several broods are reared we have a seven-story flat on each successive floor of which a linnet and a phoebe have nested phoebe's nest is mud linnet's is straw and hair each builds atop of the others it may grow to be a skyscraper yet many of the mother birds sing at nesting time the house finch or linnet keeps a continual twitter while incubating so also the goldfinches these notes are low and very musical and happy the phoebe speaks her mournful note under the eaves while on the nest by close listening when other things are noiseless one may detect the almost inaudible note of some of the hummers the ear of a nature lover grows keen by practice there are low nearly inarticulate whisperings among the birds in summer days never heard by those who have not learned the art of listening the nest of the summer yellow bird may be within six feet of a person on the hunt for it who though of keen eye may never find it for lack of as keen an ear to hear the low note of the mother bird behind the foliage by close observation one may come to disprove many things said against the birds for instance a neighbor told us to be careful how we encourage the orioles and phoebes to nest in our grounds if we didn't want them to eat up all our honey-bees as usual with us in such cases we accepted the warning with a pinch of salt and took to making observations on our own account locating ourselves behind an open window near the beehives we watched a vine trellis with top bar uncovered offered safe footing to phoebe on she came with five young phoebes hatched on the fourth floor flat under the eaves the young birds were whining for food as plain as any words can be they cried bees bees please and bees they were to have for dinner the mother led them to the trellis bar where they squatted in a row peeping their longings bees were flying thicker than hail the mother canted her head from side to side the black eye of the upward cant searching the homeward bound insects why don't you help yourself we wondered 
in a few minutes the bum bum of the drones was heard then mother phoebe darted and darted and darted each time she snapped a big stingless bumming drone which she killed by banging its head against the bar then it was taken by a little phoebe or more often by two phoebes who tugged at the creature until it came in two parts or was cunningly appropriated as a whole by one of them this meal-time went on until all were for the time being appeased and the family flew off by the middle of next day they returned and went through the same performances very amusing to the witnesses inside the window now not a single worker bee was touched and the mother phoebe knew the exact hour for the flying of drones these lazy shiftless bumming fellows never leave the hives until the day is far advanced and the sun has warmed things up so not breakfast but dinner was made of the drones as for the orioles we were willing to give them a chance to speak for themselves they appeared about april tenth as usual and straight for the bee corner of the garden they went i told you so said the neighbor we watched there were rose bushes and vines in that part of the grounds and to these the orioles hastened as fast as their wings could take them the beehives sit under a row of moss roses so thickly covered with spines that one cannot take hold of them without gloves but this pair of orioles ran up and down and in and out without fear these and many other rose bushes did they examine minutely pecking away as fast as they could move their beaks right at the entrance to the hives they went on straggling briars but not a bee did they touch we were as close to them as we wished to be suddenly we scared them away before they should have devoured every secret and there was retreat for our neighbor the orioles had been eating the little green plant lice that infest rose bushes early in the spring later they took to watching the bees and we resumed our watch of the orioles it was midsummer and the young birds were all about crying for bread or rather for bees though their pronunciation was not so distinct as that of the young phoebes the parent orioles took their stand right at the doorstep of the hives and waited with head slightly turned alert ready for a bite not a worker did they touch but when a drone came bumming along he was nabbed as quick as a wink all drone time which lasts about two months with us did the orioles patronize the beehives unmolested did the tireless workers come pollen loaded and run in at the entrance when the summer yellow birds have three or four hungry mouths to feed just watch at the open window behind the snowball bush and see what you see little green caterpillars make nourishing food for baby yellow birds the parents might be running up and down amid the green and white of the bush just for effect of color but they are not those little soft green biscuits are the objects of their ramble it has been an open question as to whether old birds carry water to the young in the case of tame canaries they have been seen to regurgitate a whole cropful of the liquid into wading parched throats so we may conclude that young birds require water in the case of a very young hummingbird who was deprived of its mother we raised it for a while at least on milk sweetened with honey feeding it with an eyedropper such as surgeons use the milk was a good substitute for such animal food as the young of hummers are accustomed to when young hummingbirds come out of the nest and for many weeks they are either very fearless or their sight is not good surely it is not the latter unless it be atoned for by greater sense of smell for they come to flowers we hold up to them and even light on our hands and faces following us in the shrubbery as a rule young birds are suspicious and wary they know by instinct how and where to hide 
after sundown is the time to see interesting events connected with supper and bedtime by close and quiet watching one may see for oneself where and how young birds sleep some retire to the same bough or bush each night a family of bush tits slept in a row on an orange twig every night for two weeks in plain sight of us and as near as six feet from our hands the parents had been blessed with unusual success in this particular brood bringing off six these all slept in a row heads and tails whispering the softest of notes until quite dark we have never been able to account for all the eggshells that disappear in nesting times. Now and then cracked bits are found in fields and woods, but only bits. One might get some information from the ants that are always prowling about for detached morsels of animal life. The birds themselves may eat or hide them, lest they tell tales we have found shells far away from any nests as if they had been carried on purpose sometimes they lie in the nest bottom in powder it is worth while to take a peep into every nest just to get pointers but never to get birdlings and one's peeps should not be too frequent it disturbs family order and confidence besides if one takes to peeping when the birds are nearly fledged they often become frightened and leave the nest too immature to warrant freedom and safety young birds are seen to sit or cling to the edge of the nest long before they are able to fly at night they snuggle down into the warmth and warmth as much as food is essential to young birds but nesting time has an end like all good times when the late peaches turn their rosiest cheek to the autumn sun, and the husk of the beech-nut opens its pale lips, then are the nests that were so lately the center of attraction, tenantless and neglected. Old birds in passing take no notice of them, and the hungry juveniles pay no visible heed. What care they for cradles, now that the universal cry is, Bread and butter, please! Baby zephyrs nap on the worn-out linings, and the rain runs its slim fingers through the fading meshes. Even the domestic feline, who was wont to peep into the heart of every one of them, no longer is discovered inquiring into the nesting habits of birds. Forsaken are the nests, naked are the boughs. We will leave them for the winter winds to question, and the winter winds will ravel more bark for next year's nests and they will make the meadow grasses molt their softest wrappers for linings and it is the winter winds that will swirl the dead leaves into lint and pull the weed stalks into fibre therefore long live the winter winds end of section fifteen chapter fifteen Chapter 16 of Birds of Song and Story. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Birds of Song and Story by Elizabeth and Joseph Grinnell. The Romance of Ornithology. The birds must know. Who wisely sings will sing as they. The common air has generous wings songs make their way what bird is that the song is good and eager eyes go peering through the dusky wood in glad surprise the birds must know helen hunt jackson as everybody knows ornithology means a discourse about birds and people have discoursed about birds ever since spoken or written language gave us the means of exchanging thoughts in the biblical history of creation birds occurred in the fifth epoch of time when the evolution of grass and herbs and trees and seeds and fruits had made for them a paradise when the grass and trees and seeds and fruits had evolved a variable diet for the feathered folk and by instinct they have continued to follow after their food migrating on merry tours the wide world over lovers of them from earliest dates have discoursed of their ways and means of their habits their favorite resorts, 
their uses relative to cultivation of lands, their faults in connection with civilization. Students of nature have divided the birds into classes and species, as the human race itself is divided. As order is heaven's first law, ornithologists have taught us to distinguish it in the study of birds, and so we have the groups, always with reference to individual habits and anatomical peculiarities. In the old world, ornithology as a science dates perhaps from Aristotle, 384 years before Christ. True, he was teacher of ABCs on the subject, but he set students to thinking. But there were students before Aristotle. If not students of science, they were students of religion. It is to religion in many forms that we owe the romance of ornithology. We may call this phase of the subject superstition. The word itself is almost gruesome to the unlettered imagination. It suggests uncanny things, ghosts and goblins and other creatures that are supposed to wander around in the dark because they were never seen at midday or any other time. To the educated person, actual faith in ghosts and goblins has given place to a mildly fanciful imagination which indulges in the flavor of superstition as one takes light desserts after a full meal. And so we have the romance of superstition for the intelligent. Stop in to consider that the word itself means a standing still, to stare at something, an attitude of reverence, so to speak, we see how religion in ornithology preceded the romance of it. Certain of the birds waited on the deities, or had access to their presence, in consequence of which they were set apart and protected. Sometimes they were prophets of the gods, foretelling future events with accuracy. Their flights were noted by religious devotees, who unconsciously to themselves probably, and certainly unsuspected by their followers, were sure to be out at migration times. At such times, should the birds choose a natural course past a city, and be seen only after they had left it behind them, the prophet knew in the depths of his religious being that the gods had doomed that city. It was only when the study of birds as an actual science developed the fact that these denizens of the air depended more upon climate and necessary diet than upon the will of a gruesome gods, that the religion of ornithology gave place to romance. And romance is the after-dinner course of real ornithology. Romance lends a fanciful touch to figures and data, and apologizes to the average student for intermissions that seem dedicated to frolic. In the universe of romance, North America has its full share. Preceding the romance was, and still is, among the native tribes, the religion of superstition, the deities foretell certain death of persons among the Eskimos by the passing of a blue jay or the croak of a raven. Our own poet, Edgar Allan Poe, was not an Eskimo, but he indulged in the well-known superstitions about the bird when he permitted the raven to perch above his door. Many of the Arctic tribes are known to protect the ominous bird to this day. The Indians of Alaska revere it and even fear it like a black spirit from the land of demons. Song and story among American aborigines are replete with bird superstitions. So prominent was it that early historians made mention of it to preserve it, and students of languages are putting it into books, so that romance and legend may not pass away with our native Indians. The government itself is preserving the history of American superstition among its precious archives. Reports of the Ethnological Bureau are entertaining reading for vacation times. True, they are heavy volumes in some cases, but there are supplements. Were these reports placed in more school and other libraries, the inclination to read more objectionable and not half so entertaining literature would go quickly out like a fireproof match without burning the fingers. To those who find a fascination in prehistoric legends, the study of bird representation on the ancient pottery of some of our western Indians and in the mounds of the Mississippi Valley is offered in some of these government reports. They are a very mine of suggestion and information. Imagination, subtle guide to many a self-entertaining mine, runs fast and faster on before while one reads, and one wonders how it came to pass one never knew about government reports before. 
The Ethnological Bureau is the poet's corner of our government, the romance of our dull facts and figures. Without its unsleeping eye forever scanning the sky of unwritten literature for gems, how would some of us know about the history of the human race as preserved by the Iroquois Indians, and that birds had a wing, if not a hand, in the peopling of America at last? Of course America was all the world to these Indians, and naturally enough their priests and poets combined to give some adequate genesis for the people. It is said that a story, once started on its rounds in civilized society, gathers facts and things as it goes, until at last, and not before very long, its own original parent wouldn't recognize it. Not so the legends that have come to us through savage tongues. Simple to start with, they maintained their original type without a trace of addition. What students gather for us of folklore is as correct as though the first text had been copyrighted by its author. Note this simplicity in all barbaric legends, the discourse coming straight to the facts and leaving off when it is done. This one legend referred to the origin of the human race makes so good a preface to the closing rhyme of our text that we are tempted to give it for that special purpose. According to this story of the Iroquois Indians, it is to birds that woman owes her history. Unconsciously to these natives of America, they identified woman with birds, and birds' wings for all time. Unconsciously, perhaps to herself, woman has also identified her sex with birds and bird wings, though in different relation to that of the Iroquois. The legend will need no further introduction to the girl or woman of America who may become interested in birds of song and story. There was once a time when all the earth was hidden under great waters. No island or continent gave foothold. No tree torn from its moorings afforded rest to tired foot or wing, for finny and winged people were all the inhabitants in being. Birds soared unceasingly in the air, and fish disported their beautiful armor plate in the water. In the consciousness of the bird and fish, there was need of higher intelligences than themselves. They watched and waited for some hint, some glimpse of other and superior beings. One day the birds congregating in the sky, discoursing on this very matter, beheld a lovely woman dropping out of the far blue. Hurriedly they talked of possible means of saving her from drowning, for they had a subtle sense that this falling object, with arms outstretched like wings, was the being they hoped for. One of their number, a prophet, suggested the means. As the lovely being dropped toward the great sea, the birds came together and lapped their wings over wings in a thick feathered island. Upon the soft deck of this throbbing lifeboat, the beautiful being descended and lay panting. Slowly and lovingly, her soft hand caressed the wings of her benefactors. She lifted the variously tinted plumage of the breasts on which she reclined, and kissed the down of them. That was long, long ago. We will conclude our text with the ending of the poem preceding the first chapter in our book, repeating four lines of the same, and dedicating this same ending to the birds. While the church bell rings its discourse, they are sitting on the spires. Psalm and anthem, song and carol, quaver as from mystic lyres. Wing and throat are in a tremor, while they pay their Sunday dues, and escorted by the ushers, they are sitting in the pews. Oh, the travesty of worship, perched above each reverent face. Sit these feathered sacrifices, closely pinioned to their place. Chant a dirge for the woman's pity choir before the text is read. Sing a requiem for compassion. Woman's tenderness is dead. On her head are funeral emblems. She has made herself a bier. For the martyred birds who shroudless, coffinless, are waiting there. Eyes dilate and forms distorted, praying as in dumb distress, poising, crouching, reeling, swooning, supplicating wretchedness. Twisted into shapes so ghastly, frightful, grim, disconsolate, writhing in a moveless torture, passion, inarticulate. Call it love of what is lovely, choice of best in nature's grace. Back of all the giddy tangle lurks the tradesman's wily face. E.G. End of chapter 16 End of Birds of Song and Story by Elizabeth and Joseph Grenell